It's me, Joey B. Hi everyone, welcome to the live stream. My name is Joe Barnard. This is the live stream. Um, I never know how to open this stuff up, but thanks for joining. Today we're gonna to be doing some maintenance on the launch pad that launches uh, just about all of the BPS rockets. Um, so what we're gonna be doing is converting it from, right now it is in a single core setup. So it's set up to launch a rocket that is basically just one cylinder. And what we wanna do is change around the launch clamps and a few other things so that we can uh, modify it so it can launch the Falcon Heavy model again. Not the actual Falcon Heavy, obviously, but yep. So there's a 148 scale model. If you're not familiar with that, um, you might be in the minority because it's definitely the most viewed midi video. But um, yeah, we're gonna be launching that again soon. I'm primarily modifying it so that um, I can display the Falcon Heavy uh, in person at NARCON. Uh, NARCON 2019 is the National Rocketry Conference that's coming up in just a couple of days in Cape Canaveral, Florida. I will be there. There's gonna be a lot of other cool things, free BPS stickers if you wanna go. Anyway, that's what we're doing today. So, um, I don't know what else to say. I think it's time to move over to the workbench. Uh, so here we go, workbench. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so I always do T. Um, I always have T from, like, during the live stream. So today's uh, live stream is sponsored. It's not actually sponsored, but it's sponsored by I think it's like raspberry zinger. It's some type of herbal tea. And it's in a Mars 2020 JPL mug, which is pretty cool too. Okay, now we're going to the workbench. All right, so we're over at the workbench. Yeah, it's always super weird starting these things because I just have no idea what to say and I feel like I have no idea what's going on. So let's look at the chat. Let's do that. Um, okay, hello everyone. Wow, there's a bunch of people here. Hi everyone. Um, Okay, there's a lot of Elon comments. I wish there were less of those, or fewer of those. Um, does anyone have any questions before we get started? So this is the launch pad, by the way. Uh, we've got all of these articulating clamps that help hold the rocket on the pad. Um, I wonder if I can give you a good example of this. You know what? Hang tight for just a second. Let me... Yeah, hang tight for just a second. I have an idea. Okay. So this is a set of landing legs. Um, this is a set of landing legs that would usually go on a rocket. You can see they fold out, they're all spring-loaded. So if I you know, take the rubber band off of this one, it locks into place. Um, anyway, so this is what goes at the bottom of most of my rockets for the Falcon Heavy. Since there are three cores, there are three of these. And the way that the whole BPS launch system works is that the legs, and really the rocket, but the legs sit right around here. And then these clamps articulate out and they lock in on the legs. So they actually lock in like right around, right around here. Um, but when they lock in, the rocket cannot lift off. And this is actually really useful for the Falcon Heavy, which is <laughs> very difficult to launch. But anyway, this is a lot of information. I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm gonna check the chat one more time, and then we're gonna get started here. Oh boy. <laughs> um, you can always tell who is new to the channel because 90% of the comments are, OMG, he looks like Elon. That is true, Colin. Um, okay, what else? Oh, I missed a bunch. This is gonna be really hard. Uh, if you don't get your question answered, you should put it in a couple of more times. Maybe, let's set like the maximum at like four or five times. I don't know. <laughs> it's just a lot of comments. Um, what material is the launch pad made out of? Primarily wood. I think it's oak? Oh, I don't know what type of wood. I'm sorry. It's a pretty dense wood though. Um, and so that's what the base is. The launch clamps are polylactic acid, or PLA. That's like really what it's usually called. PLA, uh, it's a 3D printed material. 
we'll get to uh, later on in the stream, we'll look inside the launch clamps and see how they work. Um, and then, I mean, the, flight compu uh, the launch computer is over here. This is the impulse launch computer. Um, yeah, that's what it's made out of mostly, though. Uh, would you consider going to Mars? What if it was only one way? Nope. I'm, I really I love being on the Earth, and I love not being on Mars. I like building machines that go into space. I just don't want to go there myself. Um, okay, uh, let's see. What else? Will you be able to land the boosters? I think eventually. It's really it's tremendously hard. How long is the stream? I don't know. Uh, usually like a couple of hours. It depends. One, one time I did one that was like nine hours long, but I don't think that will be the case today. Um, will it talk in a few days? Uh, I think your uh, Dat Sparrow is talking about NARCON or the National Rocketry Conference. Will it be live streamed? Probably not. It might be like a sketchy link on Facebook from someone's phone, um, but even though the talk won't be live streamed, there will be a video of it. Um, it's like a 45 minute presentation. Uh, there will be a video of it uh, put up, I don't know, less than a week after, so that's good. Um, am I excited for DM1? Yeah, it's gonna be crazy. I think I'll be there. Um, I'll definitely be down in Cape Canaveral for March 2nd, but like, it's all new hardware, so it's, it's hard to tell if it will actually launch on March 2nd. Um, let's go for four hours. Will you use a, a water deluge system? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so a water deluge system sprays water at the launch pad when the rocket takes off, um, and it helps cool things down, and really what it's there to do in real life is uh, deaden and absorb a lot of the um, noise and energy from the rocket exhaust so the pad doesn't get damaged. Now, I don't really need that at the model scale, but like nothing about what I do is practical anyway. So I think it would be fun to add a water deluge system. Charlie Garcia, who I work with a bunch of different things on at this point, um, I think he's in the chat here today, but he is he has wanted me to do a water deluge system for a long time. Okay, I have to um, probably, <laughs> Charlie says, sorry, I'll get around to that. No rush, Charlie. Do you hire free developers that can do some programming tests for you, says Lucas. Uh, not right now, Lucas, but um, maybe in the future. I don't really like doing free work because I just, I would like to pay people for what they do. Things get tricky when you do free work. Okay, go to sleep. Oh, gotta go to sleep now. All right, good night. When is the next launch? I, this is the last question, and then we have to get to work or I will never get anything done. Uh, the next launch, I think will be within the first two to three weeks of March. So I guess just mid-March, mid that's what that's called. Uh, the next launch should be the Scout rocket, the Scout D rocket. Um, that's the one that we built in the last live stream and the one that I mentioned in my failure and burnout video. Um, so that rocket, it'll be a pretty simple flight, but um, I just got a whole new shipment of signal flight computers that uh, are just recently machine made. They're all um, it's actually really cool, but there's a whole new shipment of flight computers. I need to verify the quality of those computers so that we're going to do a whole test campaign with the Scout D rocket on a couple different flight computers with a couple of different like flavors of the Signal flight software. So that should be cool. Pretty, you know, that should be pretty cool. And then we will have a landing test in March as well. Um, I keep having to delay it because the weather in Nashville, Tennessee has just been like awful. Okay, like I said, that is the last question I can take for now. It's time to get to work. So once again, if you're just joining, or if you didn't listen before, which is fine, like I never listen to anything, but um, we are modifying the launch pad. Uh, right now you can see it, it can be set up for either a three core setup, so like one, two, three, um, or a single core setup like the Scout or Echo rockets. So we want to be able to hold the Falcon Heavy on the launch pad, primarily to display at Narcon, but also because the next Falcon Heavy launch is coming soon. So, oh, hey, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for the super chat. Um, anyway, if, if you have a question, you can leave a question with the super chat too, but either way, appreciate the donation. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do, what do you think it should be, folks? I think we're gonna take the hood off of, no, yeah, I think we're gonna take the protective cover off of these two side clamps. So these guys are actually just going to shift out like one space, um, and then we have to modify the flame trench a little bit. I would like to, I've got a whole bunch of Lysol wipes here. I like to clean the pad a little bit. There's a lot of um, burned up ammonium perchlorate on here. So, you know, just got to keep your launch pad clean. 
What kind of controller is he using? Standard PID or gain scheduling or some type of online adaptive PID? Hey, Adrian. That's a good question. Right now, it is a standard PID with non-adaptive gains. That is obviously non-ideal for really long burn times or huge changing uh, center of pressure, center of mass, airspeed, all of this stuff. But for the model scale, a non-adaptive a non-adaptive set of gains um, is actually pretty pretty sufficient, um, even with a decent thrust spike at the beginning of the curve. Now, that said, um, I would like to move into adaptive gains. It's just really hard as it is, even with non-adaptive gains, to get it to make sense in a commercial product for people who are not controls engineers. So, um, one step at a time, I would like to do adaptive gains though. Um, and actually, I think I'd like to do some stuff with active fin control this summer, and that really requires adaptive gains. That's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wait, okay, so the first thing we need to do, I'm really all over the place here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to unscrew these things. Uh, what I'm unscrewing right now connects the um, articulating arm. This will be more clear in a few minutes once the hood is off, but it connects the articulating arm to the protective hood um, of the launch clamp. And I'm, uh, it's not really coming out that well, so I'm not sure what to do about that. That might be tricky. Okay, well, um, we're going to take this part off. This hardware is pretty clean too. Usually I'll replace hardware if it's rusty um, because the ammonium perchlorate ends up like super hyper oxidizing, even stainless steel stuff. Um, but uh, these are all stainless steel screws and they're holding up pretty well, even after like several firings. Um, okay, I don't know if any of this stuff is interesting. We're gonna take these screws out. Oh, this is stripped. That's no good. Uh, these launch clamps need an update anyway. I think we're probably, I keep delaying it. I think this spring it would be a good idea to um, probably just print, maybe even design all new launch clamp hardware. If Charlie, actually Charlie, if you're interested uh, and able to get the uh, water deluge system going by then, might be able to um, incorporate that into launch clamps. That would be cool. Okay, hold on, sorry, I missed something here. David Chapman, thank you for the super chat. It's very kind. Did you type all of those rocket emojis for the post or did you copy and paste them? You copy and pasted, didn't you? David, I won't lie. I did copy and paste. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to have disappointed you. I apologize to my family, to my friends, you know, just to everyone in my life that I didn't manually type all of those rocket emojis. <laughs> Okay, this is not good. Yeah, this definitely needs, this is definitely stripped here. So uh, this clamp, the time that this clamp has is limited. That's no good. These actually, I mean, I will say, so I built this launch pad over a year ago now, and it has held up surprisingly well. Like, I did work really hard on it, so I guess it shouldn't be too surprising. But sometimes even when you work hard, it's still like surprising when it actually works. Um, okay, now I can take this screw fully out. Uh, here we go. There we go, that's working. And almost there. Got it. Okay, there we go. All right, so this is the hood. Let's try to zoom in here and see if we can. Um, boy, I wonder how this looks. It doesn't look great. <laughs> um, yeah, this does not look great. Sorry, folks. Let's just try to um, really overexposes. Hold on, let me go to manual exposure. I think I might mess this up, but if I go into here and I turn the ISO off of auto, this is really not interesting. This is not what you came here for. I'm so sorry. Okay, there we go. This will work. The ISO is no longer on auto. Now we can really zoom in. Okay, sorry about that. Let's take a look at this launch clamp. So this is how it works. This is obviously a vertical view of the system, um, but you basically have an articulating arm on a servo. Let's move this up a little bit. Yeah, this will be a better view. Okay, if 
you can see that. So there's a servo here. This is just a typical 9G or 9 gram um, servo. This is like a, a lot of my parts are spec'd around some of the cheapest available components because eventually the files for this are going to be available um, or you're going to just be able to uh, print these yourself. But right now they're still under development as will become clear as you see the state of some of this hardware. Um, like there's a crack in the servo horn here, which is not good. But um, anyway, yeah, so there's a typical 9 gram servo here. It pushes the arm back. So this is the primary, this, what I'm pointing at right now is the primary um, hold down arm that articulates back. There's a bit of a hinge right there. Boy, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a bit of a hinge right there um, that moves back and forth. This helps the, the uh, primary hold on arm move back. And then finally, there's this little guy right here. This little guy helps when the articulating arm pulls back, it closes the launch clamp cover. And that's this guy right here. So that's, that's how these covers close. It's all in one motion actuated by one servo. Um, so there's a little hook for the articulating covers and basically they open and close. And actually that has been surprisingly effective. I just built these covers because I thought it would be cool to have covers on the launch clamps, but they actually do work. Um, yeah, surprisingly effective. <laughs> okay, anyway, now let me just unplug this servo here. And then we are going to take this clamp completely off. Let's see, is there any other chat? Sorry folks, I know I'm missing a lot of chat. If, you, if your chat gets missed, you can just put it in there again. I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, okay. Also, thank you, Eric, Eric um, for doing all of this moderation and all of the other mods who are in here. I really appreciate it. It's kind of... <laughs> Please, the rules for the chat are be nice, be respectful, and if you can't abide by those, you will be banned without a second chance. Um, that is a hard rule. Okay, so if is it hard to make rockets and launch pad? Will you make a Delta IV soon, an SLS? I'm, I don't have any plans to do a Delta IV rocket or the SLS, um, but it is hard to make. <laughs> it is a custom-built PC, PCB named Impulse based off Arduino. Full info at bps.space. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, if there was a question about the launch pad computer, that's totally correct. It runs on an ATSAM D... Ooh, okay, ATSAM... 256D21 or something. It's a bunch of numbers. It's an ARM Cortex M0 based on the Arduino platform. Most of my stuff is based in the Arduino environment um, and most of the PCBs are custom. Okay, uh, and the pro programming language is technically Arduino, but that's basically a just small wrapper on top of C++. Okay, um, don't ask to be a mod. Hey Joe, what's a good affordable 3D printer? What a great question! Okay, um, so I use a printer... Okay, my favorite printer, this is this may not be affordable. My favorite printer is the, um, the one that I currently use mainly, and that's the Prusa i3 Mark II. Um, it's not necessarily cheap. It, it, I think it's either five or six hundred dollars. Um, it's not the Mark III, the Mark III is more expensive, but the Mark II is perfectly good. It's either five or six hundred dollars and it prints as if it were several thousand dollars. It's really a fantastic printer. So if you want the best bang for your buck, that's probably what it is. However, I also have a Monoprice Maker Select um, 2 or something, or 3, um, and those are, I don't know, two or three hundred dollars, and they're, they're okay, um, but you do get what you pay for. It might not last, you know, a full year. So I would recommend saving up a little bit longer and going with the Prusa, but they're both good options. Okay, we have to keep moving forward here. I never know how much time to spend answering questions and doing the actual work. Um, and also, how much time to spend just completely missing all of the chat, because that seems to be a thing that I do as well. <laughs> okay. Hey, Moaz. Good to see you here. So excited to be witnessing the upcoming of an amazing company. Uh, hi, Joe. I'll also add a cue. How can I donate? How can I donate if I can't yet become a patron? What a great question <laughs> that allows me to just plug my work even more. Okay, um, the best way, so there are, there's a donation button on the website, uh, on the About page, you're welcome to use that. I do recommend, um, if you're able to become a patron, I recommend that, even if you just want to do a very small um, tier. There's a lot of cool rewards. We have a Discord server, um, there's a lot of cool things that happen in there. There's access to design file, there goes my ice machine. 
<laughs> access to design files, um, weekly update posts, or, uh, you know, like semi-weekly. I'm sometimes bad at hitting those deadlines. But anyway, that's a great way to do it. But if you don't want to do Patreon, uh, there is a donation button on the website as well. Now, uh, hi, Robert. Thanks for joining the chat. It's good to see you again, or I guess see you in the chat again. Uh, Joe, remind people to join us on Patreon <laughs> so you won't have to go back to music. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. I should call you Bob. That's right. Um, yeah, there's my, there's my Patreon plug. One Patreon plug every minute. That's about the rate that I want to hit. <laughs> okay, anyway, let's take another look at this launch clamp. I really, I, I'm proud of this design. This is another thing that Charlie Garcia helped with. He's like, he's like the behind the scenes guy for a lot of these things. Anyway, um, yeah, so this is the launch clamp and we're not really modifying this clamp right now. Basically what we're doing, um, if you're just joining us or um, again, if you like don't listen to things, but <laughs> if you're just joining us, this is the launch clamp. It was here, we are now moving it back here because we're going to be um, modifying this from a single core to a three core setup. Um, so that's what's going on. And let's look at a couple other questions. Um, when are you wanting to expand BPS space to more employees from Arctic? It's Bryn, by the way, I sent you an email. Hi Bryn, I, so I'm quite bad at email lately. February has been kind of a, uh, bad month, but um, <laughs> so I think we're not taking on internships quite yet, but I think we might in the summer. Um, I'm just not sure about it yet. I, like more hands would definitely be helpful, but it's also a logistical challenge uh, to bring on more people to a simply just one person company right now. So uh, if you're interested, you can reach out at bps.space slash contact. If someone wants to drop that link in there. Um, and try to respond to all emails. So even if you just want to chat rockets, that's a great place to go. All right, we're, we're getting nothing done. Uh, so now, let's see. I think it's, I think I'll just place this clamp here. So the way that this works is there are existing holes. I hope this is clear, like what's going on. Um, let me make sure this shows up on the stream. Looks, yeah, it looks pretty good. Okay, so. Basically, the clamp was here. We've now, we're now going to move it out to here. The servo cable gets threaded through these existing, this existing hole here. This just goes to the bottom of the launch pad, which we'll take a look at later. Oh, where's my tea? I'm gonna need some more tea soon. We'll have to go to a new flavor. I got a whole plate, like a, I got a whole pack of tea just for this live stream. All right, um, let's see, what else? Okay, yeah, so there are existing screw holes here. I only use like three out of the four. You can use four out of the four, but honestly, you basically just need like one or two. Um, they're pretty strong. They're going like through a solid half inch of wood. Anyway, okay, so we're gonna put this here. I'm gonna make sure it lines up. You can sort of feel when the screws are um, in the holes they need to be in. And then, here we go. Look at that. It's already super solid. That's just one screw. It, you can see it, it like bends a little bit here, but let's go ahead and screw these in. And one more here. Excellent. That is a solid launch clamp. You can't move that at all. Uh, yeah, so the servo cable goes through the bottom. Uh, everything's basically good to go, which means I think it's time to put this cover back on. Um, and actually, let me check one thing here. Uh, usually it's good to just make sure everything sits right. Like the holes are pre-drilled, but I kind of want to just like give this a shot. Yeah, that seems pretty good. Okay, cool. Um, let's look at the chat here. Oh, thank you, Heath, and I'm Re and Primitive Space, and whoever else put the contact link in there. Um, okay, let's, let's do, oh, there's a siren. Can you hear the siren? There's always sirens going by my house. Thank you, Finton, for the donation. Uh, much love for keeping me up past midnight. There it goes, there goes the fire truck. Um, <laughs> I can't stand sirens. Okay, much love for keeping me past midnight. Well, maybe go to bed. <laughs> I don't know, you can stay up if you want, but um, the also, yeah, this will be available after the live stream 
goes on. Man, how do I even talk? This stream will be available to watch on demand, like as a replay. So even with the chat, if you just, if you want to go to bed, like I'm not going to make you stay up. All right, let's go put this back on. How is the stream going? Rate me at one out of 10. How's it going? <laughs> All right, now this is kind of tricky to do. This is the hardest part. Um, the screw is the first to come out when you disassemble the clamp but it's the first to go in when you assemble it again. So I think that seems pretty good to me. It's just hard to line up. This is like one of the things where um, these files are pretty well designed, but lots of iteration is still needed. Okay, that, did I get it? Ah, uh, okay, hold on, I'm going around the other side. There it is. Got it. Just hard to get that. Need like a like a pilot thing there. Okay, then make sure it's connected to the screw. Sorry, everyone. Okay, there we go. Now that gets screwed in. You can use this at this point. Okay, that's definitely connected. And then if we move this. You can see it moves. Yeah, there we go. All right, one more second. Let me screw these in and then we'll take some more questions. That's screwed in. Need to get these here. Yeah, both of these are stripped. That's no good. Time to print new launch clamps. Okay. That's good. So that's one clamp. Look, you can see the um, you can see the scarring here. The last time I um, well, let's see. The last rocket to really launch, I guess. So Scout D launched on this, but um, before that, it was Falcon Heavy. So this is this is all dust here. This is all dust from the Falcon Heavy um, flight in November. Um, okay, what else? Let's see. I've missed probably a lot of things. Um, Joe, the Prusa i3 Mark II is not available for sale anymore. Oh, that's, that's no fun. It is a great printer. I'm sure, I mean, um, I know some people who have the Mark III. I'm sure that's a great option too. It is probably more expensive, but, um, okay. What else? Any plans for hybrid rocket engines from Keon? Nope, not right now. Um, yeah, as, as my, my good friend, I just mentioned Charlie all of the time, but as Charlie Garcia says, hybrids have all of the have all of the complexity of liquid engines and none of the gains. Um, I say if you're gonna go, well, hybrid engines are just deceptive. It seems like they would be simple and they are not. Um, okay, hi from Kentucky. Hey, you're really close. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. You're like right above me. Um, hey, okay, Robert. Oh, it's Robert. Robert does some really cool work. Hi, Robert. Joe. What was the most difficult part of making the single computer for you outside of software? So I like the outside of software caveat is important because the most difficult part by far of signal is the software. Um, but let's think, let me get a signal computer for reference. Hold on. Hang tight, everybody. Here's one. Okay. So here, oh, that's, this is ARC, that's a different computer. But um, so here's the signal computer. Let's uh, turn it up right so you guys can see. Um, the hardest part, I think, so, okay, yeah, it's hard to get my mind out of the software thing. So what's the hardest part of this? Like the, the PCB design, I wouldn't say is hard necessarily. Okay, we're gonna go on a little tangent. Does everyone, does anyone mind if we go on just like a tiny little tangent here? I hope no one minds. It's, it'll be worth it, I promise. It'll be worth it. Okay, Ooh. Where are all my flight computers? Here they are. This 
is the graveyard. <laughs> Woo, tangent! Okay, everyone likes the tangent. I do mind the squealing noise. Jared, you know, I can't blame you at all for that. I mind the squealing noise too. I gotta get some little felt pads for the launch pad um, feet. Okay, this is the graveyard. These are all of the flight computers that I have built, um, and some of the launch computers and a few other things. Shall we dump it out? Let's see. Should we? Should I dump it out? Should we take a look? Put it in the chat if you think I should. <laughs> um, hello from Southern California. Hi, Ryan. Yes. Rest in pieces. Yes. Okay, everyone wants the dump. Ready? Five. Four. Three, two, one. Woo! <laughs> hey, this isn't a flight computer. Hold on. That's a pen. That doesn't count. Look at all this nonsense. Wait, this isn't a computer either. This is the nozzle for Thrusty McThrustface. <laughs> this thing. That is not a flight computer. There's a lot of nonsense in here. Uh, yeah, this is like... This is like where all of my intellectual property exists. This isn't a flight computer either. This is a helium manifold uh, for the Apollo command module. Not a, not a piece of flight hardware, just a piece of hardware that didn't pass flight qualification. Um, that's pretty cool though. Uh, what else? <laughs> um, are those piggy boards? Yeah, there are piggy boards here. Let's see, there's a bunch of piggy boards. Um, what else? This one's pretty cool. This is like the bare PCB. Um, like if you didn't have a silk screen on it, that's what it would look like, uh, which is pretty cool too. So like it's the same, it's identical to, where's the, uh, where's like a signal board? Uh, here's one. Yeah, so like these are identical except for the silk screen. The silk screen is what makes the board white. Um, so this is, this is like, these are the, top, the copper traces. Um, anyway, that's kind of cool. Let's see, this is what uh, all the old flight computers looks, used to look like. This is the, uh, I think it's, this is the Relay flight computer. If you want to learn more, someone put the link in the chat here, bps.space slash avionics. Um, it's a whole history of all of these computers. Um, but yeah, these computers, this is like what the flight computers used to look like. Uh, they used to be manually hand-wired. Um, and then, in the spring of 2017, I got... I got my head together, and I started making PCBs. So this is my first attempt. Um, it worked okay. Not great, but okay. Like, good for a first attempt. Um, there's a bunch of little LEDs on here that you can see. Uh, what else? This is really fun to go through. I hope everyone else, like, is enjoying this. So let's go through it. Let's look at what it is. This is the... You can see it's actually called... Um, if you can read this here, it might be kind of tough to do. BPS, and it says Vector AVI. So that's what signal used to be called was a vector. Uh, and then I quickly learned that there is a different, oh my gosh, there are so many links to bps.space slash avionics. <laughs> uh, anyway, it used to be called vector avionics because that just makes more sense for thrust vectoring. But there's something, there's a product by this company called Eagle Tree, and they make the vector flight controller. So I was like, oh, I'll just rename mine. Anyway, this is the original uh, computer. There's a buzzer. This is the inertial measurement unit. It's a BNO055 uh, by Bosch. Uh, this is the uh, barometer. Ooh, MS. It's like a, it's a uh, TE connectivity barometer. All of this information is at bps.space slash avionics. There's a ton of LEDs. There's like 10 LEDs here because I just, you know, got to have LEDs on your computer. Um, this is the processor, ARM Cortex-M0, oh no, no, this is an M4, um, flash chip, a couple other things, um, yeah, okay, so that's the first version, and then we moved on to, uh, this is a pretty dirty version of this, let's find a cleaner looking one. This is like playing with Legos, except more expensive. Um, okay, that's one. This is a pretty good example. Okay, so this is the second version. Uh, it got more crowded. These are actually fin outputs. You can control fins with this one. Um, well, you like you can't control fins, but in theory, like you would have the electronics for controlling fins on this one. Fins turn out to be crazy hard to do. Um, but uh, 
Okay, yeah, so anyway, this is uh, Vec Signal Avionics. I renamed it. We're going to try to move faster here because we have to fix the launch pad. That's what we're here to do. Anyway, yeah, it moved to this. You can see, like, the design gets a little bit better in this next version. Uh, and then I moved to... Hmm, where's the next version after this? Oh, this one's kind of cool, too, because this one was supposed to have a screen with a little interface coming out of it. You can see this connector here. Uh, this one, the theory was, or, like, the idea was, you stick this in the rocket, and before I added Bluetooth control, I was going to have this screen plug into the flight computer so that you could talk to the flight computer and change the settings like this. Um, here's like the BPS logo, Signal Avionics GUI breakout. You can see it says it there. Um, yeah, that was not a great idea. This is really expensive to manufacture comparatively and like just fix it in software with a Bluetooth chip. Okay, moving on. Then I made this computer. This is the one that says space on it. Um, I got my head together and made the PCB white. Um, let's see, what else? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. The, com the design just gets, like, steadily better and better every time. This is, like, what iterative design is all about. If you're coming to NARCON 2019, that's the National Rocketry Conference in Florida, um, I think either on Friday or Saturday. I really should know that. Um, I'm presenting my work, um, there, and I'm going to be talking a lot. Iterative design and the power of just like not giving up and continuing to iterate on your work. Um, it's going to be a big focus of the talk. Anyway, that's kind of cool. Then we move from the space computer to the Signal Alpha computer. These are nearly identical except for the silk screen. Signal Alpha got scrapped um, because eventually, like, I just needed to make a new product. Basically, I shipped a bunch of these um, and got a lot of user feedback, added a Bluetooth chip. This is the Signal... Mm, Signal R2 dev. It's not Signal R2, but it's like the development version. So that came after Signal Alpha. Then I made truly Signal R2 um, somewhere here. Who knows? There it is. No, that's not it. Um, okay, hold on. Where's Signal R2? Does anyone know? Here it is. This is Signal R2. Man, this is a mess. What a live stream, right, folks? Signal R2, here we go. Um, that progressed to, well, basically this. This is the true version of, like, Signal R2. Um, anyway, that's the progression of the flight computers. There's also the Impulse launch computer. This is what's on the launch pad now, but I used to have Impulse, the older version, with a larger buzzer, a couple of differences, different circuitry. Um, what else? This is ARC. This one's really cool. ARC is a dual deployment computer. I'll be talking about this a little bit at Narcon as well. I really think, like, definitely come. It's going to be fun. Um, anyway, yeah, ARC is a dual deployment computer. It is super, super tiny. Like, very, very small. This is it compared to Signal. Anyway, I can hear another siren coming. Uh, I missed a super chat from I Need More Space, which, by the way, everyone go subscribe to I Need More Space. How does it feel to not have to solder anymore? Amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I finally moved from manually soldering all of these boards to a PCB manufacturer who puts them all together. Um, and it's just, it's gonna be so great. It's gonna allow for more time to focus on the YouTube channel and all of the other like more important work. Anyway, that is a lot of talk about flight computers and we are not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about it feels like I don't feel great about pushing all of these things into this box like this. But we're here to fix the launch pad. And these are pretty, oops, sorry, these are pretty sturdy computers. <laughs> They'll be okay. All right, everybody in. Y'all got to get in this box because you're coming with me to Narcon. And apparently the Apollo command module helium manifold has to go in this box as well. <laughs> okay, everybody, let's get back to work here. Uh, we still have over 300 people watching, which I am surprised by. But we've only modified one clamp so far, and we have to get two clamps done, and then we need to modify the flame trench as well. So we have more work to do, everybody. Let's get started on that. I'm going to move this over here. Maybe, maybe should take a couple more questions too. Tips for incoming PCB designers. Um, 
Hmm. Watch lots of tutorials. That's a tip. Um, <laughs> it's a fairly obvious tip, but watch lots of tutorials. Um, I think maybe a good tip is don't be afraid to start your design over if, um, if it doesn't look good. Like, what I mean is I, I went through several iterations for Signal Avionics where I thought I had designed the computer and then I just for fun was like, well, I just learned this new thing. Because, you know, when you're learning something, you're learning new things like every five minutes about how this software works. So you learn more efficient ways to do things and you learn what actually works and what actually doesn't. This is all very big, but the first revision of Signal actually took like, I don't know, four or five separate iterations of the computer from the ground up before I got the PCB printed. Uh, excuse me. I guess my advice would be, don't be afraid to give it a couple of shots um, before you actually commit to getting the PCB made. Because, you know, it's not super cheap. It's Well, it's kind of cheap, but depending on where you're coming from, it might not be super cheap to get these PCBs made. So give it a couple shots. Try to get your designs right before you actually commit them to fiberglass and copper. Okay, that's my advice. PCB design tip. Learn to like the taste of coffee. Nick Moline has the right idea. Get a way to get caffeine directly into your veins. That's a good um, PCB design tip as well. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm missing a whole lot of things here. Um, why not build a second launch pad? They're like really hard to build. Uh, you, like this seems pretty simple. I'll, I'll zoom out again. Like this launch pad seems like a, a fairly simple thing. You know, you get like a base, a couple of launch clamps and a tower. That's all you really need. But it's surprisingly complicated, or it's just surprisingly tedious to do if you're building it yourself. So I, I just have one launch pad. Um, okay, a couple more questions and then we'll get back to work here. Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit because how much money do I do with BPS? It's gotta be at least $10 at this point, honestly. Can you live stream your conference talk for us to see? Um, probably not because I'm going to be focused on just recording it, but someone might be there to live stream it. We'll see. Um, I wouldn't count on it, but it will be available to watch after. Um, when will ARC be available, says JR Craft. I think uh, it's so hard to predict because there's still a lot of development to do, but like we do have a prototype to work on. Um, I'm still targeting like summer-ish for the release of ARC as a commercial product. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of flex in that timeline right now. Um, okay, let's do two more. How exact is the height measurement in the rocket? How exact is the height measurement in the rocket? Well, the barometer at any given moment could be up to two meters or one meter off, depending on the noise, just because it's very sensitive. Um, however, on average, I don't know, it's good enough to about a quarter meter, a little bit less than that. If you average it out and filter the data enough, um, it actually gets pretty smooth. So this is another one of those things that can be fixed in software um, so that your hardware is cheaper. If you're willing to put in time to make your software work a little better, um, you can usually save a lot of money on your hardware. Do you plan on making large serial staging rockets in the future? Yeah, I mean, the Falcon Heavy is a staging rocket, but um, I'd like to start adding more second stages to vehicles just requires more powerful motors too. Um, okay. Or just buy a PCB printer. Kevin Stewart, let me tell you what, man. If you want to buy me a PCB printer, I will use it. If you want to pay that price. <laughs> uh, is there a file I can get to 3D print one that is like your Falcon rocket? Uh, that is, that has got to be over a hundred different files. Maybe not over a hundred, maybe like 40, but there is definitely not one file to print the Falcon Heavy rocket. All right, and one more. Um, all the design files are available to BPS Space patrons. You have to purchase the $25 tier or higher. That's right, that's the Miko tier. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of released files there. Um, the reaction control system, the video I just did, those files are there. Um, there's simulation files right now. I feel like there's one other. Yeah, there's schematic files for the PCB. Um, the design files are gonna be there in, I don't know, I'm trying to get that in like two weeks. Um, but yeah, the design files for the PCB for blip and plop will be there. Okay, it's a lot of talk. There are still sirens outside. What is going on? Who's getting hurt? I would like for people to stop getting hurt. Um, 
Okay, this is going really well. Let's start by unscrewing this here. There it goes. All right. So we're gonna unscrew the hood. This is just like the one we did before. Um, unscrew this. And there we go. Now this one is a little bit more rusty. Here, check this out. So I mentioned earlier, um, depends I guess who is watching, but I did mention earlier that the, oh my gosh, here comes another siren. Can you hear it? Here it comes. There it goes. Too many. Okay. Um, see how this is a little bit oxidized? Isn't that kind of cool? So this is what happens when you can actually see like what parts of the screw were exposed. Um, but this is a little bit oxidized because these motors, when they burn, especially the ammonium perchlorate, um, they like super hyper oxidize um, any, anything that can be oxidized, basically. Anything that can rust does. This is iron, and this is one of the flame trench pieces. <laughs> the iron goes nuts with the uh, oxidation stuff. So these do not last a long time. I am not here to tell you that this is the best launch pad design because it is expendable over the long term. Like you have to replace nearly every part of it. Um, okay, but once again, that is not what we're here to talk about. Um, we are here to fix this launch pad, folks. There's one. Here's two. Let's go ahead and take these parts out. Oh, these are hard to unscrew. Can we get BPS mugs? I feel I wouldn't wear a shirt, but I would definitely love a, bl a branded caffeine holder. Good idea, Colin. Hey, I actually did want to ask that question. I put like a little list of topics that I want to cover in the live stream today. And one of them is merchandise or just merch. Um, like merch seems to be like the more popular way to say it. Anyway, but BPS branded things. I would like to do, definitely like to do a coffee mug, mostly because I would like to have more coffee mugs that are branded. Um, but yeah, coffee mugs, stickers, um, baby shirts. Be cool to do like a jacket. Um, I don't know, what kind of stuff would you like to see? There's another siren. You hear it? Enough! Please stop! <laughs> All right, we're unscrewing this one. This one's stripped again. This one's really stripped. Wow, that's not good. <laughs> okay, so here's the inside of the launch clamp. Yeah, there it is. Um, here comes another siren. <laughs> Round two. Hey, Joe, have you ever thought about using um, LQR or LQG instead of PID from Peter. Hmm, that's a great question, Peter. Let me look those things up so that I can pretend to know what they are. LQR, LQG controller. This is interesting. I like controller design. LQR, LQG controller design. I hear another siren. I can't tell if it's coming toward me or going away. I think it's coming toward me. Um, oh, okay, free, okay, yeah. Linear quadratic regulation, this looks cool. Here it is. Listen up, here's the siren. I'm counting that at two, as two. It sounds like there's a cop car and a fire truck. What is going on? Let me look up Nashville News. Nashville News. There's a landslide, a mudslide, but that was four hours ago. It seems like that wouldn't be it. Um, I have no idea what's going on. Someone keep a siren count going on. Anyway, um, I think if you're, you're asking about switching uh, from PID to LQR or LQG, I don't have plans on it, but that's because I don't actually know much about it right now. I would like to look into it. Actually, if you want to chat about that stuff, uh, reach out bps.space slash contact. I would love to chat about controller design. Uh, that would be cool. <laughs> oh, Arsenio's in here. Hi, Arsenio. What's up, man? 
Mod actual undead. <laughs> um, who's going to Narcon? Raise your hand if you're going to Narcon. Raise it high. Put a hand in the emoji if you're going to Narcon. I'm going to Narcon twice. Let's fix this launch pad. Let's drink some tea too. Oh, I'm almost out. Mm. Good. We are officially out of tea. And there we go. Another one. And one more. Oh, and we have to unplug this. We have to unplug this servo here. There we go. Now it's unplugged. And... Bada bing, bada boom. Look, there's more scarring from the Falcon Heavy flight. Um, you can tell it under the, under the, um, oh no, that's FOD in the flame trench. FOD in the flame trench. Ah, that can't stay there. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> you don't want to have that. There we go. Um, okay. There's a lot of chat here. Do I play KSP? That stands for Kerbal Space Program, for those of you who don't know, and I do. I say this on every single live stream, but I would love to do a live stream where I pay, play Kerbal Space Program. I think that would be a lot of fun. Are you going to watch the Falcon Heavy when it launches? Maybe. It depends on when that happens, and it depends, like, what I have going on. Um, I usually prioritize BPS work over going to see launches. Uh, BPS Space, download a radio scanner app on your phone if you want to know what the sirens are about. I do want to know, but I also want to finish this live stream. Um, at BPS, I love this channel ever since I subbed four months ago because you inspired me to build my own rocket out of cardboard and I'm currently making my own version of the Falcon Heavy called the Talon. Nice name. <laughs> That's cool. Um, uh, are you going to watch the BFR launch? If it happens. Uh, that's, that's condescending. It will probably happen. I don't know if I'll be there. That's a long time in the future. Um, okay. You could film the launches and upload it, so it's also BPS work. There you go. Jonathan's got the right idea. All right. Um, now we're going to move this clamp over here. Ah, sorry for the squeak. Um, I'm actually, actually, I'm going to go to an intermission. Uh, because I have to make more tea. Look, we're we're out of tea. Um, isn't this a cool mug? This is this has nothing to do with a live stream. But isn't this cool, Mars 2020? I went to visit JPL. Um, well, I was in California anyway, but I went to visit JPL like a month ago. Oh! I hear it. There's another siren coming. Get hype! <laughs> anyway, yeah, we need to get more tea. I'm going to take a quick intermission. We're going to wait for the siren to go by. Because we just need to, we need to get that siren count way up there. I want more than 10 sirens on this live stream. You hear it? I think it just went by. That was a quieter one. Um, <laughs> yes, please wash your hands. I don't know, I think my hands are, are very clean. <laughs> no, they're, they're nasty. There's a bunch of soot all over my hands. Um, okay. It is time to go to an intermission. Now listen up. Hold on, uh, we're gonna switch uh, seats here. Back to the webcam. Okay, everyone, put your hands together. You don't have to put your hands. Ooh, look, they're really, that's really not good. That's very dirty. Um, listen up, folks. We're going to an intermission. And what this means is that there's a link that's gonna pop up um, in the intermission, and all of the mods and all the people, everyone who can, I want you to spam this link in the chat. Well, no, like, don't spam it, but it's coming. I need you to go to that link and experience what it is. I won't tell you what it is. It'll be a surprise if you don't already know. And don't go away. Listen, if you go away during the intermission, I'm going to know. There are mechanisms in place, and bad things are going to happen if you leave this live stream. I, it's, I don't know, this is, this is a bad joke. I'm going to go to an intermission. I'm going to make some more tea. I think I hear another siren. Yeah. 
I think I hear another siren. We have to wait. I'm going to answer one question. Can you hear it? Siren number six. Yeah, we need a siren counter. Can someone set up a siren counter for Joey B? I guess just type how many sirens there have been. Um, I don't hear it anymore. Maybe it stopped. Okay, we're gonna call it gone. I don't want to just like sit here and listen to sirens while a bunch of people watch. This is not. This is not a. Um, <laughs> this is not a good use of anyone's time. So we're going to an intermission. Go to the link in the intermission, and then when we're back in a couple of minutes, we're gonna finish the launch pad stuff, and we might do some things with Falcon Heavy. We'll see. Don't go away. All right, here we go to an intermission. Don't leave the live stream.
You hear it? There's another siren. <laughs> what do I do? What do I, like, what's going on? Does anyone know what is going on in Nashville, Tennessee? Why are there so many sirens? Nashville news. Let's try it one more time. Um, no, look up news for Nashville. <laughs> what is going on? I don't see any news. So there's just lots of sirens. I get, maybe we'll find out in a few hours. Who knows? Um, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the Barnard Bathroom Review. We're back with a new flavor of tea. This one is called True Blueberry. We've got it in the same cup. <laughs> I hear another siren. Here it comes. This is insane. This is, this is like, it, they are bad. Like, the sirens are bad, but they've never been this frequent. Um, okay. <laughs> that is incredible. What are we at to? What's, what's the live stream count? I think it's eight. Looks like Keon's got it. <sighs> okay, hold on. Jared says, Joe, you should check the thing I posted. Let's go over to check. Um, let's see what's going on. Jared posted something. Ooh, BPS.space concept mug. That's cool. Here, I'll post a link to this. There's another siren. That's nine. Here, there's a link. Yeah, that's siren number nine. There's another one! This is nine. And then this is 10. The higher one is 10. <laughs> Bob Hench says, you're the only one hearing the sirens. Raise your hand. I just want to make sure I, I just want to make sure I don't sound crazy, but like, Am I the only one hearing these sirens? Um, let me know. Can you hear them? Oh my gosh. All right, so we are officially up to 10 on the siren. Bob Hench, thanks again for the donation. Really appreciate it. It is probably time to get back to the actual build. I'm gonna, one more time, I'm gonna look up Nashville news, just in case. The last time there were this many sirens, a plane at the local airport skidded off the runway. So like, you know, I don't want to joke about it if it's really a serious thing. And it, it probably is, but I have no idea what's going on. So no one comes here to listen to sirens. They come here because of the rockets and maybe just to watch me flounder around and pretend like I can answer the chat in an effective manner. Um, but let's go back to the workbench here. So once again, I've got my true blueberry tea. We're filled up, we're ready to go. Mmm, that's good. Okay, Joe, would you be interested in collaborating on a liquid-fueled rocket? This might be an old comment. Nope, it's pretty recent. Um, I think so. That is from... Oh, no, I lost it. Ah, sorry. Kyle. It was Kyle. It's Kyle someone asked if I would be interested in collaborating on a liquid-fueled rocket. I would! I would like to get into liquid-fueled rockets um, pretty soon. Well, not soon necessarily, but... I'd like to start working on that in 2019. There is a project in the works with four to six other engineers. Um, I don't know how much I can say about it. I can probably say anything, but it will be cool and it involves needing a liquid fuel engine because uh, there's a lot of precise control involved. So if you are building a liquid engine that can lift between, oof, Hmm, let's say 150 to 750 pounds, um, whatever that is in kilograms, like 150 to 750 pounds. If you have a liquid fuel engine that is tested uh, and you want to work with BPS.space, shoot me a message at BPS.space slash contact. Okay, yeah, it's time to go fix this launch pad. 
I thought I heard another siren. I feel like I'm going insane. <laughs> Let's get this in the right place here. We go ahead and zoom in again. All right. There we go. And... Nice. Nice, and we have one more to do. This guy right here. Excellent. That is pretty solidly in there. Feel good about that. Am I talking about the guard? Oh, Kyle. Hey, Kyle. Um, Kyle Shalies. Oof. Sorry for butchering her name. I hope that's okay. Uh, am I talking about the DARPA launch challenge? Okay, if you're not familiar, the DARPA Launch Challenge is a challenge by DARPA, the Defense... <sighs> Defense something, Research Projects something. I don't know exactly what DARPA stands for. Someone can put it in the chat. Um, I was briefly a part of the challenge. I am no longer a part of the challenge. I just... It seemed like... It is such an immense challenge to get something in orbit. The challenge is get something in orbit on very short notice twice. And you can get, I think it's up to $10 million or something like that. But it's a, it's a significant amount of money. A couple companies are competing. Rocket Lab, Vector, um, a few others are competing for that money. And it's just... Let me get on my soapbox here. <laughs> Should I do the soapbox? Does anyone want to hear the soapbox rant? I'll get on my soapbox if you want. Kyle, to answer your question, it is not for the DARPA launch challenge. It is for something just for BPS.space. Uh, no, that's not true. It's BPS and a couple other engineers. It's like a collaborative project, but it's not for DARPA. It's not for Orbit. Um, that's what I can tell you. Soap it up. Sure. Soapy boy. Please rant. Okay. Here's the rant. Also, hi Arsenio. Thanks for your text. Um, here's the rant. It's a short one. I'll keep it short. And it is this. If you're starting a space company, after 2016, and by space company, if you're starting an orbital launch company after 2016, you have already lost. Don't do it. Um, the I don't think the market can expand fast enough to accept the number of new companies that are that currently exist. Like I think at least some of them will have to die um, unless they just ride out on investment. I mean, like you could be successful in the way that Uber is successful, where they continue to burn cash, but take on investment. This is like from a business standpoint, but like, if you want to work in the space industry, orbital launch is not, is no longer the way to make money. Like that ship has sailed. Um, you should focus on something else, like the technology that gets manufactured in space, like manufacturing in zero G is a huge thing. There's a lot of cool things you can do there or focus on like building things that help orbital launch companies, like capitalize on the bubble that there currently is. Um, yeah, so that's my, that's my soapbox. That's my little soapbox. It's, it's um, a box full of soap and there's a, there's a bunch of soap inside and that, that's what it is. Anyway, <laughs> okay, let's look at the comments. Um, yeah, Ian says, it seems like there's a new small set company every month. Yeah, like everyone wants to be Elon Musk, which is cool. Elon has done a great job. Of, but well, Elon and also like I don't know between four and eight thousand other people have done a great job uh, at SpaceX of making people want to get back into that stuff. In a in a, they have like revitalized a lot of cool things. The thing is, there are a finite number of customers, and they will be they will grow, but not at, I don't think at the rate that the current that like current launch companies are popping up. Does this make sense? I hope this makes sense to everyone. Um, if it doesn't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Joe, when do you plan on, de from Drew, hi Drew. Joe, when do you plan on demonstrating RCS in flight? BTW, you're a huge inspiration for me. Keep up the good work. First of all, thank you very much. It's very kind. Um, when do you plan on demonstrating RCS in flight? So, the reaction control system, um, the video that I most recently posted, it needs at least two months. So what month is it? February. Something like that. <laughs> Let's say 
March, April. Mmm. Boy. Late April, early May. That I think that's ambitious. Someone's gonna clip someone's gonna take a clip of this and send it to me in late April and early May when I definitely haven't done it by then and be like, look, I told you so. But I think I think I could probably fly something as soon as early May. Let's not say late April. Early May. Mid-May. <laughs> we'll see. The problem right now is that like like the software is not too hard to get right, even with a totally new controller with more adaptive PID games, things like that. Um, what's really difficult is, and not actually difficult, just work intensive, is um, getting a new flight computer online, like a totally brand new flight computer. Um, a lot of the existing signal software, like the existing code base can work pretty well. Um, I just have to get that computer done. So like the schematic is done for the, I think I'm gonna call it Relay, RCS computer, um, but I just like, I have to get it printed and assembled and like make sure there aren't defects, things like that. Mid-May. Mid-May. That's what I'm saying for RCS Flight 1. We'll see how close I can get to that. <laughs> um, okay, let's do one more question and then I have to get back to work. How long have I been going so far? Does anyone know? <laughs> um, what small set companies do you think will survive the sustained profitability slash launch rate? I'm thinking only Rocket Lab, Vector, and Firefly. I think Virgin can sustain themselves indefinitely because Virgin is a, a powerhouse of money. Um, that's Virgin uh, Galactic and Virgin Orbit. Um, I think... Um, let's see. Yeah, Rocket Lab can probably survive for a long time. I mean, they're launching already. Um, I'm not sure if they'll be able to hit, what is it, like 100 launches per year? That's like a full country with multiple launch providers is still unable to do anything close to 100 launches per year. I'm skeptical of that. However, they're ambitious and they, they're like, their flights are working. So Rocket Lab is definitely in a great position. Vector, I don't know. There's a lot that I just don't know about Vector. Firefly, again, same thing. Firefly was came back from the dead. Um, they were dead like this time last year. So, or no, 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 this time two years ago or something. But um, Firefly, I also don't know. They're making really quick progress though. Like all of the things that they post, it seems like they're moving pretty fast. Um, yeah, but there are a couple other companies that are like just getting started and I think they will all fail. Like if you're not, if you're, if you're more than a full year from your first orbital test flight, I think you will not make it. Um, I don't know. I'm not like the expert on this. I fly model rockets though. Like <laughs> I could be completely wrong about these things. These are, this is all opinion. This is like by no means fact. Um, okay. Um, okay. Do you think launcher space will survive? I hope so. They're really cool. Um, I mean like, a lot of these things are, like, I want success for all of these people. I just don't know how many will actually find it. Um, okay. Um, 75 minutes, says Drew. Hi, Drew. I mentioned you a bunch of times already, but thank you. Um, get back to work, says 4D... A user named 49,999 views, that's their username, says get back to work. A user named hello goodbye says cheese. So the chat is going really well. Let's get back to work. Uh, where is the hood for this launch clamp? Right here. Let's go ahead and move this over, take a sip of tea, and then get back to work. Come out to Mars for the commissioning flight of Rocket Lab US Pad. That would be awesome. Um, I would love to go to New Zealand to see a launch too, because New Zealand's just like a beautiful country. So, wait a minute, how does this work? Is this correct? Hold on, let me screw this in real quick. Okay, yeah, that works just fine. So, I'm going to go ahead and put this hood on here. And then, does anyone remember before, what we have to do is first screw in... Okay, hold on, this needs to get fixed here. That was coming loose. 
These, I, I, I think I've said it before and I'll say it again, but this launch pad is, it's not on its last legs, but the clamps are. Um, I'm modifying this in this way now because it needs to be presentable at Narcon, but uh, I think before the next Falcon Heavy launch, I should replace most of the launch clamps. Yeah, I think it would be a good idea. Either way, um, I'm missing a screw. I think this is it here. So we're gonna go ahead, screw this in here. So this is the connection between the protective cover and the whole like articulating mechanism here. Um, and we're gonna screw this in, probably over tighten it. Sometimes it's sometimes it's helpful to over tighten this stuff. Um, this is that's the same sort of philosophy philosophy with the thrust vectoring mount too. Let's get some more questions in here. I would love to answer some more questions um, about BPS rocket stuff. Take shots every time he says, let's get back to work. Don't do that game, you will die. You will have to go to the hospital and I will hear more sirens near my house. Do not do that. <laughs> Someone commented on the RCS video, take a shot or take a drink every time he adjusts his sleeve. Um, which don't play that game ever. Uh, don't play that game either because you will also die in that scenario. Um, but I'm missing some screws. Does anyone know where they are? Because I don't. Hold on. I'm still here, I'm just getting screws. I found some. Here they are. One and two. All right. I've missed some chat. I promise I will get to it. However, I'm going to screw these in first and then we will get to the chat. One and oops, two. There it is. That is nice, strong. Look at this, folks. We in three core mode. Sorry, neighbors. I shouldn't, I shouldn't yell. <laughs> the neighbors are gonna kick me out. Okay. Um, the Rocket Nerd says, Joe Barnard, or BPS.Space, how did you design your own PCB? Lots of work, lots of iteration. If you wanna know more, go to bps.space slash avionics. Uh, put it in the chat, someone, maybe, please. Thank you. Um, Hey Joe, why did you make a space company instead of just doing it as a hobby, even if you're doing it as a hobby with the company? So, um, I'm not really a space company. I don't really know what I am. I guess the closest is like YouTuber, but I don't, I don't know. At some point I had, cause I'd been doing it as a hobby for like two years. And at some point, like you take a look at how much money you've spent and how much time you've spent. And it's like, well, it would be great if I could not purely just lose money on this. Um, and so I just did what I had to do to make it a business. So um, we now sell these signal flight computers as a thrust vectoring kit with some thrust vectoring hardware. You know, I'm on Patreon with like exclusive rewards, like um, access to the BPS Discord server, things like that. Um, and yeah, so it's a proper business now and it's full time. I mean, I love rockets. Like if I can make it a business, I would love, I. It's, I'm, I feel fortunate to like have been able to do that. Um, okay. What 3D modeling software do I use? Um, I have used Onshape for a while. I think I might, I might switch. I'm not sure yet. I might switch, we'll see. Um, Philip James. Hey Philip, thank you for the super chat by the way. It's very kind. Joe, did you settle on a manufacturing process for the 3D printed part of the motor gimbal that kept melting? Cast resin slash milled aluminum? Great question. <laughs> no, I have not settled on one yet because um, I haven't been able to focus on that part or I haven't chosen to focus on that part of the Falcon Heavy just yet. So 
Um, that's basically the only thing holding back Falcon Heavy from flying again, and I wouldn't even use the term holding back because I've just like, I just haven't looked a whole lot into it. We got a lot of offers from a, a couple different machine shops or people who have access to machine shops. I think we might go with like an aluminum thing, but actually, I had this thought the other day, and I think, I think the center core ended up losing a lot of thrust due to the, let me make sure I pronounce this correctly. Hold on. Due to the Krushnik effect. Krushnik effect. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's spelled uh, K R U S H I H N I C. Someone can write it in the chat. But the Krushnik effect. I think we ended up losing a lot of thrust in the center core during the second burn because of the Krushnik effect. So I think I'm going to. I might not even need to choose a different material, but just do better engineering based on the properties of the polylactic acid material. I have some ideas for how to do it. I think it will work. I'm not sure if it will, but I think it will. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> thanks for asking. Um, and thanks for the super chat. Uh, hold on, I've missed a bunch. Okay. Um, uh-oh, someone says screws went into the exhaust vent. I don't think they did. I'll check before I launch again. What, um, did anyone else hear a crackle in the audio? Um, I hope not. Uh, hey, primitive space, please don't spam the chat with all caps. Thank you. Um, Okay, do you plan to design your own motors? Not really. Um, BPS stands for Barnard Propulsion Systems. And <laughs> the, the funny part is like, I do everything with rockets except the propulsion. Um, so I don't know, don't name your company before you've actually started building things. That's the lesson there. But uh, yeah, so uh, I don't think I plan to do any propulsion work right now. I probably continue, I will, I will probably continue to outsource that stuff to companies like Aerotech or Cesaroni or um, uh, like if things get really serious like Morton Thiokol or something like that. Okay, I hear it too. People seem to be hearing small crackles. Let's look. Let's take a little listen here. People seem to be hearing small crackles. Let's look. This is a Let's test. A listen here. I'm testing the audio. I kind of hear it. I, I don't really hear it. Um, if it's a really big problem, let me know in the chat. Otherwise, um, I probably won't spend time fixing it. Can I run for president? Nope. I do not want that job. <laughs> Have you looked into annealing the PLA? That's a good way to squeeze out some better material properties for a relatively low amount of time. Philip, that's a great idea. I haven't looked into that yet. Um, that's a great idea. Let me think about that a little bit. That's a really good idea. Thanks for putting that in the chat. Um, are my, are your, altim <sighs> having a stroke, are your altimeters responsive enough to rely on, or do you primarily, primarily use the accelerator? Oh my gosh, I cannot say this. Are your altimeters responsive enough to rely on, or do you primarily use accelerometer data? Thanks for the question, Larry Allen. Um, they are pretty responsive. The sampling rate for most um, barometers is, I don't know, between like 10 and 40 hertz, uh, sometimes like 7 and 40 hertz, or 7 and 20 hertz. doesn't really matter. But the problem with barometers is that they are really noisy. So what you're measuring with the barometer, or at least a barometric altimeter, is um, the air pressure. And there are a couple of problems with measuring just air pressure to determine altitude. And one of them is just noise. It's like the change between one and two meters in the air pressure, like if the signal computer moves, you know, is on the ground and then it moves one meter up, that change in air pressure is so, so, so tiny. It's very hard for the altimeter to sense that. But if you have good filtering between your accelerometers and your barometric altimeter, you can get pretty accurate data. Um, it's a little bit like fusing your accelerometer and gyroscope uh, measurements to get orientation data. The gyroscope is really fast, but also very noisy. The, uh, the gyroscope is really accurate, but drifts over time. The accelerometer is really noisy, um, but stays stable over time. So the barometric altimeter stays stable all the time and is really noisy. <laughs> and the accelerometer is really 
fast um, and can fill in the gaps between where the barometric altimeter can determine where true north is, or like true north, which is like the actual altitude of the rocket. That is a very complicated way of saying yes, kind of, um, to the answer of your question, which is, are your altimeters responsive enough to rely on or do you primarily use accelerometer data? I hope that helps. Um, do you plan on getting a part-time assistant? I, I don't know, maybe. It would be nice, but um, that also requires money. <laughs> um, what do you think of Space IL's new launch to the moon? Awesome! I love going to the moon. Not me personally, but like, I love when people go to the moon. I think that's really cool. So, good job. How do I start model rocketry? There are some links to that. If you go to the bps.space page, uh, bps.space slash about, there are some links to getting started. I recommend picking up a couple of rocketry kits. Um, and, you know, just getting familiar with the hobby. You can change a couple of things, start modifying stuff, start experimenting. Um, model rockets are a great way to get into aerospace engineering. Um, so pick up a couple kits and get to work. Um, okay, my audio equals normal from Weatherworld. Thank you. Um, ba 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 ba. So, doing some reading, why have you not pursued an engineering degree specific to what you're looking to do? Self-education is great, but there might be some holes in your knowledge base you are missing. From J.G. Haverty. Um, yep, totally true. There are really weird holes in my knowledge, um, especially for the specific field I, I like doing, which, I don't know, is a lot of different things, but let's talk about, like, control systems. So, someone earlier said, why are you not using... Um, uh, the, t the question was, why are you not using an LQR or LQG controller instead of PID? And I didn't even know what that was. Um, so there are, there are serious holes in my knowledge, but um, I also, I think I just learn best through self-teaching, and I find, like, tremendous satisfaction in doing things this way and just sharing what I'm learning online. Like, I don't claim to know everything, and um, my plan is not to, like, build super high stakes things that actually put thing, put vehicles in orbit. Like if you're going to orbit, you almost certainly need an engineering degree and a lot, a team of very highly skilled people who also have engineering degrees. However, I'm having a ton of fun just doing it at the model scale. So you don't need an engineering degree for that. You just need a will to work really hard. Um, you need, you need a little bit of funding and you need a lot of time and the willingness to just like not give up. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Oh my gosh. Okay, one more. And then, who has the counter that says, you need to get back to work? And then we need to get back to work. Um, okay, hold on. So, shouting, I don't know how to pronounce that. I know source files are going to be kept behind closed doors, but exactly how involved was the process of selecting signals components and getting them to, to communicate with one another? Um, I think the question is like, how hard was it to get all of this stuff working together? And the answer is, I, I, I don't actually know how to answer that. There's a lot of different components that are on the signal flight computer, but like the whole process of designing this is just iterative over the course of a few years. So like every revision, only one or two components change. So it doesn't seem that hard in the short term, but in aggregate, I guess very hard. Um, I don't know. If you have any specific questions about specific components, I can talk more, like, focused on those. Yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, I said one more, and I have to, um, I have to get back to work. Okay, take another shot. I have to get back to work. <laughs> Here, I'll drink from my tea thing. Oof, all right. Good tea. This is my favorite so far. I had raspberry before, but the blueberry is really, like... Nice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to turn the pad upside down. These are all solid. Here we go. This looks awful. This is what it looks like when you don't do great cable management. It's okay cable management, but it's like not passable if I were doing anything serious. This is an excellent way to uh, exempt me from any type of serious work ever. Anyway. <laughs> So what we're gonna do here is right now, as I've mentioned before, the pad is in a single core setup. Um, 
The pet is in a single... <laughs> Someone says their bottle of whiskey is getting low. <laughs> don't drink... Don't play drinking games with things that I do, because I repeat a lot of things. Okay, so... Um, the pet is in a single core setup, which means that this is one inlet and two outlets here um, for the exhaust of the rocket. But we have these other two um, options for inlets here. They're plugged right now, so we're going to unplug these and then put uh, two more inlets here so that the side cores and the center core can fire through the flame trench. However, what we have to do first, and I forgot about this until just now, is loosen the U-bolts on the top of the launch pad. They are one, two, three, four here. Um, these U-bolts, these U-bolts basically like strap the flame trench to the base of the pad, to like the dance floor of the pad. Um, the Falcon 9 has, in the Octaweb, the bottom, the very bottom of the rocket is called the dance floor. I just think that's such a cool thing. But, um, yeah, like the dance floor of the pad, the whole um, plane in which the pad is based, they are strapped to that with these U-bolts. So, there's a long-winded way of saying, time to get these U-bolts loosened. Sorry for the squeak. How heavy is the pad? Oof, a lot. Wow, thank you, Dupali. Thank you very much. That's a that's a kind donation. Um I um You can put a message in there too if you'd like. Um let me know if you have any questions. Joe, do you know what sticky backs are? We use them to secure wires when terminating inside of enclosure or panels uh, or, or panel. Uh thanks, Nathan. I don't actually know. Um right now my primary cable harnessing stuff is zip ties, um, or rubber bands. So, I might look that up. Yeah. <laughs> Jared and Arsenio. <laughs> yes. Um, you should sell supplies to make rockets. I do! Sorry, I don't mean to sound frustrated. I do. I mean to sound excited because I do sell supplies to make rockets. If you go to bps.space slash slash signal, um, I sell a thrust vectoring kit for rockets. And it has just recently come back into stock. It was out of stock for a while, we got a bunch more delivered, so it's back in stock. Okay, we need to loosen these U-bolts. Here we go. We're gonna start from, start from the center or start from the sides? I think start from the center. These need to be replaced too. These are getting rusty. Center one, center two. I'm gonna loosen these a bunch so that the side the sides are basically the only thing holding it up. Okay, there we go. And then we gotta do this one. Sorry for the noise. The squeaking isn't like a super pleasant sound. <laughs> All right. All right, that's good. These two. There we go. All right, so these two U-bolts are loosened. Now we need to get these two. These cannot be hand untightened. Get it pliers first. Oof, this one's really tight. That one's really on there. Okay, and one more here. That's loosened. Here, I just felt the flame trench move. It's gonna fall out in just a second. Let's see, this might be it. This might be what does it. Yep, there it is. You see that? It just fell. And we'll punch this out. All right, there we go. The flame trench has been loosened. So now, turn it back upside down. Oh, we should, uh, I'll make it face the camera here. That'll be better. So, 
this is loose now, right? This whole thing can rotate because these U-bolts are now, they're not jamming it up against the, um, the launch pad. So these two plugs need to come out. I'm gonna use some pliers for that again. And I'll let's, let's dance for some more chat here. Why not cut down the U-bolts? I don't know, they just came in this length. It didn't bother me that they were longer. Um, okay. Do I play Kerbal Space Program? I do. Mm, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, I am making my own thrust vectoring system. Can I use an Arduino Uno instead of Signal with Shield? Because the Signal kit costs about 30,000 Indian rupees. I do not know how the conversion rate works there, um, but you can make your own uh, thrust vectoring system with um, Arduino or any other platform that you want to use. It's just very difficult to do. Um, yeah, you can you can totally do that with Arduino. We're building the landing model rocket series with Blip and Blop, and they're all based on the Arduino. Sorry, the Arduino platform. Uh, frankly, I think you could do it. Maybe not with an Uno. Um, you could probably do a really simple version with an Uno. You just want like faster processing speed if you can possibly get it. Um, the orientation stuff is where. I think most folks will end up struggling. Um, that's where I ended up struggling for sure. Ugh. Okay, that's not a good angle. Oh no. Kian. Kian wants me to ask Alexa what my name is. I think he might mean Siri. So, should I do it? Does anyone know what's going to happen if I ask Siri what my name is? Don't say it. Don't say it in the chat. But do you know what will happen? Oh, man. Does everyone know? <laughs> Should we ask? Should I ask Alec uh, Siri what my name is? Seems like people want it. Oh, someone says no. Nathan Smith says no. Enlighten us. Yes. We know what time it is. <laughs> yes. No. Yes. I think it's mostly yeses. All right. Let's do it. Here, right, let me clear my notifications. <laughs> One sec. All right, here we go. These are, these are my dogs. I love them so much. Um, okay. <laughs> hey Siri, what's my name? You're Joe, but since we're friends, oh. I get to call you Bingham. <laughs> Don't look too close. That's my phone number. Let's. I shouldn't have done that. Let's try that one more time. Hey Siri, what's my name? You're Joe, but since we're friends, I get to call you Big Papa. Yep, that me. <laughs> I don't think you can see the phone number on that. Right? Yeah, that's too bright. <laughs> that was a little close. I'm glad I didn't lower the exposure. I almost docked myself. Docks myself. Can you show us your first launch pad, Joe? Yes! I can! Hang tight. One sec. It might not be what you think. Okay, you ready? Here it is. This is the first launch pad I built. That's it. So this is just the base of it, but it's it's got holes all over it. It's like rough and gross. You can see like all of the scarring here. Um, this is the bottom of it. You can see like this is where the flame trench used to be. It's much smaller than the current launch pad. Um, it's a little hard to tell with the fisheye lens, but it really is like a lot smaller. Um, definitely could not support a, a three core setup. Although I guess the holes were pretty much in the right place to do a three core setup. Um, but that's, it, it couldn't, it probably couldn't support all the launch clamps and everything. That's where the tower was right there. Um, in the very, very beginning, these two holes were for uh, buttons to hit the, um, these were for buttons to like arm the pad and then launch the rocket. That's a bad idea. You should definitely have a remote on your launch pad. <laughs> anyway. That's the old launch pad. It's kind of interesting. 
Tad Maxwell. Joe, I've got to go. Good night. Godspeed. Thank you. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Big Papa. Joe gets one thing done. Okay, let's look at some questions. <laughs> All right. We have to get back to work. Take a shot. <laughs> okay, I just, I, just one more question. Just one more question. Um, how do you design the launch clamps? What kind of forces are they dealing with? I'm working on my own for high power rockets and don't really know where to begin. Uh, my recommendation, I think I recommend don't do it for high power rockets. Like, there's not a, there's not really a practical point. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. There's not really a practical point for launch clamps unless you're launching something as complicated as the Falcon Heavy model. Like, because otherwise you're just spending propellant on the pad and you already have so little burn time with most model rocket motors, even in high power that you don't really want to constrain it down. I looked at, the uh, NASA has published, um, I don't know, probably a while ago, but you can find the designs for the Saturn V launch clamps online if you just look up like Saturn V launch clamp schematic or design file or something like that. Um, and I just, I based my design off of that initially and then someone looked at it, I think it was Charlie Garcia, I looked at it and was like, this is terrible. Let me help you with the design. And then, I don't know, um, lots of iteration. Same as uh, most of the work. Okay. I said we would get back to work, and now we actually will. So here we go. Take the plugs out. Mm. Okay, there's one. Right there. That's good. Do I like chili beans? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> All right. There we go. They're really tight in there. You don't want any flames coming out of these. There, that's better. All right. Oof. Yeah, these have seen some. These have seen better days. All right. So those are the plugs. Now we are going to go ahead and put the inlets back in here. How heavy is the Falcon Heavy? Heavy. <laughs> I don't actually remember how heavy it is all up. Um, it is true to its name though, it's heavy. Um, why do you use flame channels? Because you don't want the flame going all over the launch pad, damages electronics more, um, can come back up and hit the rocket. It's just not a, you know, not an excellent idea. Oh boy, I don't know if this is gonna be able to fit in there. Usually it does. Will that fit? Yeah, I'll be fine. <laughs> it'll work. If you can hammer it in, it'll be fine. <laughs> These are things you can do at the model scale and not when you're working in the real aerospace industry. Um, Jared says, is your upload low? Buffer for the stream is low. Yeah, I pay for the lowest grade internet I can, I can possibly get just because I want to save a lot of money. Um, but uh, it'd probably be better to get some higher speed stuff pretty soon. Okay, do you think I can twist this one more? Uh, that would be ideal. How tall is Thrusty McThrust face? Thrusty's like a solid two meters. It's a pretty big rocket. All right, let's do this. And This is my idea. Ah, uh, there. That's much better. Okay. There, now that fits. This basically all fit. That one doesn't fit super well. There it is. Now they're all in there. <laughs> and my hands are dirty again. Uh, it, it's hammer time. <laughs> it sounds like me when I work. Well, that should work. 
What is the base made out of? Wood. I don't know what kind. Sorry. Uh, I, I don't remember what kind, really. Um... LOL dude, if you lived in Texas, you could use my tools. I have actual tools. <laughs> I have actual tools. They're just very cheap. Uh, where did you get your parts for the flame trench, and what is their temperature tolerance? I got them at Lowe's, and um, uh, I don't know what their temperature tolerance is. Um, let's see. Let's just make sure this still looks good. Yeah, okay. I'm just making sure the stream quality looks good and I'm watching it back on my computer. Yeah, this still looks fine. Um, if there's any lag, it's probably because um, I'm bad at reading um, comments. Oh my gosh, when will ARC be ready? ARC will be ready probably in the summer, but no guarantees. Okay, this feels pretty good. We're gonna go ahead and start to tighten these U-bolts here. I have to do it from the bottom while the launch pad is upside down because I don't want the flame trench to fall down. Like, I want the flame trench to be up against the launch pad when I start to, like, hand tighten these U-bolts. Um, it's hard to explain why if you're not, like, sitting here. Uh, okay, cool. That feels pretty good. Now I can turn it back over and we can tighten them a little bit more. There it is. Got three, three inlets ready to go. All right, that feels pretty good. I'll tighten these middle U-bolts. Why don't you just use PVC and spray a high temperature resistant coating inside? It would make it lighter and easier to work on. I don't think you understand what high temperature resistant coating does. <laughs> that will not, uh, that will, it, the PVC will still melt. Uh, you, want a, uh, you want a material that can absorb a lot of heat before it starts to heat up. So like iron has a really high um, thermal mass, which means it takes a lot of energy to change this launch pad's temperature. Um, and also PVC, out, like stop using PVC in your model rockets. It outgasses a lot of nasty stuff. Um, Arsenio just said that too, but like, yeah. Don't, don't use it. <laughs> you will, you will, your future self will not thank you for that. Um, you're going to have charcoal hands if you don't clean, clean the flame trench. Yeah, I've already got charcoal hands. Um, good night. Good night for 49,999 views. Good night. Um, have you considered making your own more rocket engines to get more precise impulses? This is something that I don't think, like, I just want to walk through the logic of it. Me making my own rocket engines will not get me more precise measurements or more precise motors. It will probably almost certainly get me less precise motors and less precise performance. I don't have all of the equipment that Estes or Aerotech or Cesaroni or any of these other companies have, I would need to make a really significant, tremendous financial investment in order to obtain the same accuracy that those companies have. So like me making my own motors will be cheaper in the long run, but it will, it will be less accurate for several years until I can like get all that equipment. And it's just not something I'm interested in doing. Um, <laughs> uh, just watch your podcast from the flight test. How was the interview? It was awesome. Yeah, I had a lot of fun on that. Um, how is the launch pad bottom not catching on fire? Uh, you just don't burn the um, you just don't burn the motors on there for that long. Uh, what do you use for your YouTube live streams? I use OBS. What in-flight cameras do you recommend? I use Runcam cameras. Uh, they're pretty good. They're like the poor man's GoPro and the Rocket Man's GoPro because they're lighter than GoPros. And they do a ton of slow motion stuff. Um, does signal parse data automatically, i.e. for MATLAB? Sort of, yeah. Um, the SD card that goes into signal in the back here, um, it spits out a .csv file directly. So it's really easy to put into MATLAB, into Curve, into Google Sheets, um, any basically data parsing program, it's all CSVs tabs. Um, it also logs all the settings before flight for every single boot up. Um, 
Have I ever used Micromax motors? No, I have not. Um, okay, hold on. <laughs> There's a lot going on at once here. I have to go to school, Joe. Morning here in India. Goodbye, Dipali. Thanks for joining. Um, and thank you for your super chat earlier, too. That was very kind. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. CSV stands for Comma Separated Value. Um, thanks, Jared. That's a good clarification to make. So we have hand-tightened these U-bolts for the flame trench, and now we need to <laughs> do this type of hand-tightened. Vice, vice grip, that's what that's called. I know words. I know how to do words. <laughs> so we're just gonna tighten this a lot more. Um, you know, the thing that seems to be a constant in rocketry and in any type of control systems engineering is like, any time that you can make whatever you are trying to control or whatever you are dealing with a rigid body, like any time that you can avoid multi-body dynamics is a good thing. So like the Falcon 9, I don't actually know what the control software looks like, but almost certainly um, the Falcon 9 has to have a lot of compensation for, I mean, any orbital vehicle has to have compensation for like, how does the vehicle flex in flight? Like the bottom of the vehicle and the top of the vehicle, they are so far apart that they will have slightly different orientations. You know what you can look at? <laughs> Excellent. I use really good hardware. Um, you know what you can look at? Go watch the Ares 1X flight from NASA. They do a bunch of different um, modes and vibration testing during that flight, and especially when they show the onboard camera, you can see this massive solid rocket motor. I mean, this thing that is like, I don't know, it has to be at least 10 stories tall. It's flexing and it's bending. So your control software has to be able to understand how the vehicle flexes and bends. And it's like, where do you put your orientation sensor? Your, you know, the top of your rocket is at one degree and the bottom of your rocket is at negative one degree. You basically want to have as much of your rocket rigid as possible. How did I get talking about this? That wasn't even a question. I just like went on a little rant. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry everyone. I just like went on my own self-propelled rant there. Um, <laughs> let's just make sure these are tight. That feels pretty good. We'll do the side ones now. Do I have to fl clean the flame trench after every launch? Um, says Derp Batman. Thank you, Derp Batman. Um, <laughs> I do not have to clean the flame trench after every launch. I do have to um, replace parts of it periodically because the iron oxidizes so severely that it just like, if you leave it around for long enough, it's not gonna be a good idea. Also, before you deal with this stuff, like make sure you get your tetanus shot. <laughs> um, okay. Um, PWM hybrid motor for throttling. I don't have in an interest in building hybrid rotors right now, sorry. Um, pay, do you pay attention to your rocket max Q? Says good guy McGee. Nope, my rockets go pretty slow, um, like really, really, really slow. All of them are under, except for thrusty McThrust face. Um, all of them are under, ah, uh, 30 meters per second. Um, Thrusty goes like several hundred, but um, yeah, so max Q, like G, lo uh, like arrow loading and things like that aren't really an issue. The only arrow forces that I need to be worried about are the ones at the top of the vehicle that um, make it unstable at higher speeds, but those aren't, that's not uh, the same thing as max Q. Okay, what motors do you use for heavy and echo? Uh, most of my rockets, this is probably better answered generally, but like most of my rockets use one of several motors. Uh, they are the E9 or F15 by Estes. Sometimes the E12, uh, someone recently flew a signal um, computer, uh, a signal uh, R2 kit with an E12 motor, which I like thought was too light, but apparently not. Um, yeah, those, those by Estes are great. The Aerotech, <laughs> it happened again. The Aerotech Long Burning G Motors, so that's like the G12, the G11, the G8. Um, they have an H13 that I'm trying to buy right now. But yeah, uh, all those motors, those are great. Um, 
the F10 by Apogee, and I think there's like an E6 or something like that by Apogee that might work if you can get your rocket really light. Um, lots of great options though. You should make a cover for the Impulse Launch Computer. I do have one, it's just a pain to take on and off, so I mostly would rather like just replace the computer when it gets trashed <laughs> than put it on and off. Why is the test flight so far away? Isn't there a field that you can go to which is closer to your house? Um, you want to you want to be really careful about where you launch your rockets. You don't want to launch in busy parks. You don't want to launch in places that you can't fly rockets. You don't want to launch in places that they say you shouldn't fly rockets. Like all of these things. So I try to go to a really remote location where I won't bother anyone. And this is not a very nice way to say it, but where no one will bother me. I want to stay really, really focused when I'm launching rockets so that I can get everything right, go through all my pre-flight checks, all of that stuff. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is, is still fairly experimental, so you just want to stay really focused, and not having anyone else at the test site is a great way to make sure that happens. Oh my gosh, why don't you use stainless steel tubes instead of iron? Stainless doesn't rust like that. Also, shouldn't the PCB be on the bottom? Uh, I don't use stainless steel because Lowe's didn't sell them, and I just wanted to build the pad pretty fast. Um, and like, whatever, it's not super expensive. This is... This flame trench is a year old, and it's probably about time to replace it, but it has supported, like, I don't know, however many launches I did in 2018. Oh. My gosh. Okay. Take a drink, because it's time to get back to work. I might have another one of the blueberry teas. These are really good. What else do we have to do? So the flame trench is all set. Did we tighten all the U-bolts? I think we did. Boy, I really should have kept track of that. Yeah, that feels tight. That's definitely tightened. That's tightened. That's tightened. Okay, yeah. So the, this looks pretty good. Um, these clamps are ready to go. This is ready to support the Falcon Heavy. Um, basically, each core has this same mount. One here, one here, and one here. And the clamps hold onto the whole vehicle. And then eventually, when it's time to launch, it gets released and it launches. Um, so what else can we do? Uh, I think I should probably clean up the launch pad, so let's get some wipes and do that. And before I do that, we are going to take one more intermission. Now listen up. If you leave the live stream, you will regret it. I won't tell you why, but you'll regret it. It will be bad for you personally. It will be bad for you emotionally. Don't leave the live stream. That's the rule. Don't leave the live stream. I'll be back soon. I have to take an intermission because I have to get more tea. And boy, what a great stream. It's going really well. I'll see you soon.
it's me again. Hi, sorry, that was loud. Um, okay, listen. So, hello everyone. I'm back. Um, he back, says Drew. He ascend, says Arsenio. <laughs> um, okay, we didn't dip below 200, or at least it looks like we didn't dip below 200 views. Let's hope it doesn't go below 200. If it does, I'm leaving forever. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, so the launch pad has been repaired. But now we need to clean it up a little bit. So let's go do that. And then I think it would be fun to just like hang out for a little bit and do some other things. Um, but let's go clean the launch pad over here. Okay, here we go. I've got a new mug this time. This one is a NASA mug that my dad got me. It says, it is rocket science. You can't really read it. And I can't really tilt it to the side for this camera to read it. But it's pretty cool. It's got a bunch of schematics on it. Um, I donated $30. Please use it to purchase a cheap socket wrench set, says John Tech. John Tech, I will do it. Could you, actually, you know what? Could you re recommend me a socket wrench set and I will use your $30 to purchase it? If you go ahead and head over to bps.space slash contact, um, let me know what socket wrench set you think would be good and I will do it. I will put your $30 to good use. Um, did you leave to check Twitter? I did. Oh, my gosh, listen to this idea that someone tweeted. Let me make sure I get the name right. Benjamin Gotch tweeted, I don't know, I think that's how I pronounce your last name. Benjamin, if you're in the chat, first of all, hello. Thank you so much for this wonderful idea. I feel like this is per perhaps the best idea that I've had this year. And th that not that I've had, but that someone has had this year. Here we go. Have you ever thought of building a crew capsule? Not like an actual man, but perhaps a stand-in crew, like Lego figures, or maybe a G.I. Joe figure, something that can carry the four crew and have an abort tower or system to pull the capsule, capsule away from the launch vehicle. I love this so much. Oh my gosh. So I could have like, people send in Lego figures and they could fly on the crew capsule and then I could have an abort system. I could do like a ground abort test and an in-flight abort test and I could build a little tower, like a little 3D printed tower with abort motors in it, and I could use like A or B motors as the abort pull, like pull tractor motors, or I could try to do something like the SpaceX crew capsule that has uh, the abort motors inside of it. Um, or like the new Shepard has like a little thrust vectored motor in the bottom. Ah, I'm so, I love this. So I think we're gonna do this. Thank you, Benjamin, for the idea. I love it. Um, okay, <laughs> what is this, a rocket for ants? Um, use ants in the crew capsule. No, 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 no live animals in the crew capsule. My success rate is not high enough for me to want to do that. Um, okay. So let's just clean things up a little bit. Get some Lysol wipes here. This is, a lot of this prep is being done for Narcon. Uh, that's the National Rocketry Conference coming up this week. So I just want it to look pretty clean. The good news is I'm driving there, so I don't have to go through TSA or anything. Um, because if I if I did, I think I might not pass TSA with the amount of black powder soot that I have on me. That's always the thing I worry about when I go on flights. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of black powder residue in my apartment right now, and ammonium perchlorate, and all of these other, you know, fast-burning materials. And it just makes me wonder, when am I going to get in trouble for that? <laughs> I feel like one of these days I'm going to head to the airport and they're going to be like, why do you have all of this stuff all over your clothes? Okay, probably best not to talk about that too much more. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions? Let's look at the chat. Um, all right, send him a Lego Elon. Uh, TSA, okay, you're probably already on a list. Seems, it seems likely, Jared, it seems likely. Um, what are the electronic board installed on the launch pad from Chetan? Hey, you should go to bps.space slash launch dash pads, or someone can link it probably in there. Uh, but that gives you all of the information you need to know about this launch pad. You should check it out. Um... As someone who has gotten on a plane with 
cordite residue on my clothes. It gets you swabbed and explanation, and then I left the range a bit before. All good. Thanks, Arsenio. That's good to know. Um, why not just bring the whole rocket? I am bringing the whole rocket. I'm bringing a ton of stuff. I mean, actually, most of the reason, honestly, for driving is that um, I just, like, it would be tremendously expensive to ship all of the things I'm bringing. So let me entice you to come to Narcon 2019, or just tell you, like, what's going on. Um, basically, I think I'm going to bring an RCS demo, so you'll be able to come up to the BPS booth at Narcon and, like, play with the RCS control system. Um, <laughs> that's really redundant. RCS is reaction control system. Anyway, you should be able to play with that. Um, I'll have a little thrust vectoring demo as well that you can play with. I'll have free BPS stickers. I'll have candy. You gotta have candy at the conferences. That's the number one move. I'm gonna try to find some space-themed candy. If you have any space-themed candy that you would recommend, please leave it in the chat. I need suggestions for that. Last year I had Milky Ways, and I would like to get something more rocket-themed this year. Where is Narcon, says Jackson. Jackson, it is in Cape Canaveral, or it is at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Um, I think specifically at, uh, like, the Radisson Hotel there or something. But, yep, it's all booked up. There's a ton of, there are a ton of really um, excellent engineers and rocketeers there. I really recommend going if you can. Of course, you know, not everyone can travel there or not everyone lives near enough to the area to go. But if you can go, it's a great way to uh, meet other rocketeers Communicate with other people, um, get connections, get connected to people who can help you. Like last year, um, <laughs> Narcon was the way that I got connected with Aerotech, and then they started making motors for BPS. Um, I really recommend going if you can, or if you have any business being in rocketry. Um, okay, that's enough for the Narcon pitch. <laughs> Charlie Welland, $5. Thank you, Charlie. That's really kind. If you have a question, let me know. Um... Okay. How does your pad not burn? Uh, high thermal mass and low burn times. I am in Georgia, but I have school. So when is it? Um, it is in. It is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. This coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You can look up more info about it. I think someone just posted the link to it. Uh, yeah, Eric posted the link. Thank you, Eric. It's good to see you, by the way. I don't think I've like mentioned you yet, but good to see you. Thanks for hopping in. Um, yeah, Eric posted a link, narconnar.org slash site slash narcon-2019. Um, okay. Just cleaning up the launch pad now. I'm gonna make sure it looks pretty good. Also, it's unplugged. That is an important part of using a wet rag on electronics. Okay. What else do we have here? Are you filming the next Falcon Heavy launch? Of course, yes, always. Um, so the next Falcon Heavy launch is coming up. Whoo. Early April? Let's say early April, and if I hit that date before, it will be great. I'm not totally sure. There's a lot going on in March. We have the next few flights of the Scout rocket are happening in March. The next landing test is happening in March. Um, Ah, I think it will probably realistically happen in early April. That's the next Falcon Heavy launch. Okay, clean a little bit more here. Is there a way to email you where I can add attachments? The contact form on the website doesn't allow them. I'd like to attach some CAD renders. renders. Sure, Philip. Um, if you want... Boy, will I regret giving out an email address on a live stream? Probably. <sighs> Philip, um, if you just email me and... If you reach out via the contact form, or if you have already done so, I try to respond to everyone, but if you've already reached out, you can send another contact if you'd like, and just say, I'd like to attach some files, I'll respond, and then I'll get in touch with you. I'd rather not say an email address on the live stream, just in case. Um, the costs are me to, for me to get to you are $1,600. Are you going to be any closer to Sweden anytime soon? Yikes! Probably don't spend that much, um, unless you really have like a lot of business doing rocketry, um, making that your living, but, um, I don't think I'll be near Sweden anytime soon. The closest I will be is probably Boston, Massachusetts, but that's not that close to Sweden. Sorry. Um, okay. Ba -ba 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 -ba.
how do you deploy your second stage? Pneumatic actuator, ejection charge, pyro from Jackson. Uh, good question. So the second stage is on, is like passively connected to the center core on the Falcon Heavy. The second stage um, actually separates itself. It just burns the motor inside of the center core, which then pushes it out. Um, it actually sort of pressurizes the uh, top of the center core, which helps push the second stage out. Uh, that's basically how it deploys. Uh, when are you going to Boston? I don't know, just that's, that's where my family is from, that's where I'm from, so I go back to Boston every now and then. Um, okay, good night by Learn Something. Good night, Learn Something. Thanks for stopping in. What other questions can I answer? Are there certain computers I can buy for the launch pad from you or a third party source? Also, I bought a Signal yesterday. First, Charlie, thank you for buying Signal. That's awesome. Uh, I can't wait to ship it out to you. Um, I wonder, maybe this is yours. This is almost certainly not yours. The signal kits that ship are like, <laughs> they're managed in a better way than just like sitting on my desk. But um, thank you for buying the signal kit. And the question, can I buy a launchpad computer? Yeah, probably later this year, or I'll just release the files at some point. But I would say 2019 is the year that we do some launchpad files and computers like that. This computer is built to be used by other people in that it has like, a bunch of extra outputs and things like that. As for third-party solutions, you can always build your own with an Arduino system or a Raspberry Pi, or uh, you could use something like SP STM32 or any of those. That is a more complicated approach, but you can always do it. Um, I live like 30 minutes away from Boston. Are you doing an event there? Nope, no events there are planned right now. Have you attempted your L2 certification after Thrusty McThrustface? Not yet but Thrusty is capable of an L2. It's a 38 millimeter motor mount. So that will happen this year, I think. Where is the Christmas kit that you made a video on? What was used in it? Uh, Weatherworld, if you check the description of the video for the Christmas video, you'll find the links to that. Uh, okay. Take a drink because it's time to get back to work. I think, sorry for the noise. I think this is probably good. Um, this is probably clean enough, at least for now. So, I wonder what I should do. Let, uh, should I try to mount the Falcon Heavy on here? Yeah, why not? Hang tight, let me get the Falcon Heavy. It's, it's in pieces right now, but let me get it. This is what this is what the Falcon Heavy looks like right now. This is the center core minus legs. Although it does have a flight computer, this is the um, oof. That's a leaner. Oh, that's right. The center core got damaged. I will need to fix that too. Um, this is the um, this is the right booster with no legs and certainly no top and no flight computer either. Although this is the motor that it flew with, um, and this is the left booster with the legs deployed. Wow, these, um, these rubber bands aren't that strong anymore. Anyway, yeah, this is the left booster. So let's pull these legs up real quick. <laughs> Eric says, Joe, don't make this a drinking game. Also, Joe, time to take a drink. RIP center core. Yeah, it is true to the real scale though. My center core did have issues. All right, so this core goes there. This core goes here. And the center core goes here. So it slides down onto these two mounts. Ah! Hold on. Um. Okay, yeah, the center core is, is seriously damaged. So <laughs> these, these cores actually don't stay upright very well. The bottom of the center core, if you're looking on like right here, if you can see that, like right around here, the center core has a big crunch at the bottom of it that I'll probably need to fix pretty soon. Oh, I wonder if I can fix that before Narcon, at least so it just looks better. Also, Here's something, I think before the next flight of the Falcon Heavy, I'm just gonna rebuild a lot of things. The side cores are in pretty good condition, but most of this rocket was built over a year ago. 
um, and then the rest of the year was spent doing software and things like that. But I think I will probably rebuild most of the Falcon Heavy hardware. It's going to take a lot of work, but I think it's going to be worth it, um, especially with parts like these. Like, this has too much infill um, and, like, could be made maybe half the weight that this is currently. So, like, we can get the rocket higher. We can get it moving faster. We can get more reliable flights, better control authority, all of these things um, by rebuilding the whole thing. Okay, I have to take this off because I can't, like... <laughs> I'm, like, hiding behind the rocket here. Hold on one sec. All right, everybody. Coming back here. Um, can I adapt the signal computer for a liquid engine and add rocket? No, you cannot. Um, unless you have an entirely different controller for a liquid engine. The signal kit is for low and mid-power model rockets. If you're flying something higher power with active control, you need something with higher quality hardware. Not to say that Signal has low quality hardware, but just that Signal uses cell phone grade sensors. So if you're flying something dangerous, like a liquid engine or like a hybrid rocket, you want, like, it is the responsible move to either build your own flight controller or buy it from a serious company like, um, I don't know, you could buy it from like Northrop Grumman or Bosch or whoever makes um, avionics for, you know, larger computers. You could do consulting. Um, okay. Um, do you realize, you do realize that when you make a BFR, you won't be able to use landing legs or fudge the landing burn. Do you think you can do the, la the land on the mount for that? <laughs> who said I'm doing a BFR? And who said I'm landing on a mount for that? Um, are you planning to use liquid engines on your rockets for the near future? Near future, no. Far future, We'll see. <laughs> um, you seriously got to get better internet, lol. Okay, yeah, it's probably time to upgrade my internet speed. Um, are the hold are the hold down clamps are the hold down clamp STL files available for download? Not right now, but this year, almost for sure. Um, just one step at a time. So the next landing model rockets episode, we're gonna have the full PCB files ready to go, so that you could print and build your own blip and blot flight computer. Then I think it's probably, I'll probably just go right to the thrust factoring mount. The thing that is hard to convey is that like most people want access to the thrust factoring mount files. And that's like maybe 5% of the complexity in getting thrust factoring rockets to work. So like, I just, I want to make sure people are well set up before they have the file. So they don't just like launch a bunch of rockets that don't work. I hope that makes sense. Um, can you do a live stream where you calculate stuff for the Falcon 9, like Delta V, Max Q, ISP? Uh, maybe, yeah. I mean, that's not, that's not like super the goal of BPS, but I don't know. I'm, I'm open to it. Um, are you still going to try to work for SpaceX? That is an open-ended, I will give you an open-ended answer, which is that right now I'm quite happy with what I'm doing, but I don't want to close any doors. Um, yeah, Arsenio says, the software is the magic sauce. How much would a flight computer cost from Northrop? Ha! Should we shop for some, for some, um, maybe that would be a fun exercise. Maybe that would be like a fun way to spend. Does anyone want like the stream to keep going for another few, I don't know, like another 30 to 30 minutes to an hour? I'm all done with this. It might be kind of fun to like shop for like aerospace hardware. <laughs> To like look at Northrop, like Northrop Grumman has public catalogs of like all of their defense and aerospace stuff. Um, that might be kind of fun. Like they sell thrust vectoring systems. I'm not the only vendor who, you can buy a thrust vectoring system from Northrop Grumman. Um, okay, first of all, everyone pause. I want you to go into the chat and say, thank you, Nathan Smith. Write T-H-A-N-K space Y-O-U, Nathan Smith because Nathan Smith has donated a pretty serious donation, said, get yourself a vice grip groove lock pliers, V-jaw, three-piece set. I use mine almost every day at work. Nathan, I do have vice grips, um, but I don't think this is what you're talking about. These are pretty low quality. Um, they, I mean, they are like groove lock. Anyway, if you wanna, um, 
if you wouldn't, if you want to make a recommendation, I'm happy to spend the donation on someone. Someone did this earlier about um, like a um, what was it? It was a it was a set of some type of oh, this is so bad. Anyway, if you want to make a recommendation for what specifically you would like your donation to go to, you should reach out bps.space slash contact. I would love to hear about what you think would be best to spend that money on. Anyway, thank you very much, though. Either way. Um, okay. <laughs> thank you, Nathan Smith. <laughs> Socket wrench set. Yes, sorry, everyone. Joey B's memory is, is not so great. Too much black powder. Too, much, too many black powder fumes. Um, all right. I think, I think it's time to head over to the computer. Well, this is like, we'll call this like the after hours live stream. So I've got my, I've got my tea. This time I have perfect peach. I don't have blueberry or raspberry. It's continuing the theme of, um, uh, herbal teas. Bob Hench, thank you so much for joining. Bob Hench says it's time for my, my Ambien in bed. You have that in common with Elon, apparently. <laughs> Good night. Thank you for joining. Um, do you use metric or imperial fasteners? I know I'm kind of spamming, but I need to know to get the right set. Yeah, sorry, John Tech. Um, I, I don't mean to, like, the spamming is okay. I just miss a lot of comments. Um, do you use metric or imperial fasteners? I use mostly metric, sometimes imperial. Like, these are, um, these U-bolts are imperial because, like, I live in America and I bought them at Lowe's and, like, Lowe's loves imperial stuff um but uh i try to do metric almost all of the time nearly all nearly all of the bps space hardware is spec'd around m 3.5 millimeter screws um i just do that for consistency sake and so that like all i do is every few months i place a massive order with mcmaster car for new m 3.5 millimeter screws um and i'm all set i like metric better but it definitely is more expensive um, Joe used to be the lead engineer at SpaceX. No, I should not. <laughs> it is really easy to... How do I say this? It's just... It is... It, it is so tremendously difficult to do the engineering that companies like SpaceX, not just them, but like companies like Orbital Flight, like, I don't think any one person truly understands how phenomenally hard it is to get orbital flight to work. I should not be the lead engineer there. Um, all right. Okay. It's, <laughs> what is going on? Let's go back to the workbench. Let's all, let's all head back over here to the workbench. Hi, everybody. It me, Joey B. Now, if you'll stick with me for just a moment, hopefully we won't lose, like, all of the viewers during this period, but there are gonna be, there's gonna be about a minute and a half to two and a half minutes. Mm. A minute and a half to two and a half minutes where I uh, switch some things around in the live stream so that I can display the, um, whatchamacallit, my browser. That, that's what it's called. Uh, so let me go ahead and let me just pop out the chat here. I'm gonna modify a few things. Just stick with it. Um, <laughs> We will, in just a moment, get all set here. I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, just change some things. I know this doesn't make any sense. Uh, let me go to studio mode for a second. Uh, desktop. So move this around. Um, hold on. Uno momento. I have to move like three or four things around for this to work. This layer, all of my resolutions got, they got botched a little bit. I did a screen recording with OBS a while ago and what I'm doing right now is just making sure that the, um... okay, here we go. I'm just resetting up OBS so that everything looks good here. Um... Okay, hold on. Thank you for your patience. Um, why is the webcam cropped? This is going really well. That's another siren, by the way. If anyone heard that, that's another siren. So the siren counter, I think, goes to 11 now. Um, 
I wonder how many viewers were losing during this section where I click on the screen and drag things around. Let's go ahead and turn the desktop cam on. And we're about to transition over to the screen that looks like a somewhat respectable live stream. Um, let me just go ahead and move this over here. Oh my gosh. We're almost there, folks. This is, what a stream. Um, all right, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. I'm gonna move this over here. And we're gonna move this over here. Okay, one, two, three, and where's the transition? Transition, there we go, Northrop Grumman. <laughs> I hope. We didn't lose too many um, lose too many viewers there. What we're gonna do now is we're just this is like BPS after hours. We'll say um, we'll see if uh, we'll see how this comes out. So, oh hey Charlie's still here. I don't know what the plan is here. Let's just like look for some orbital components. So Northrop Grumman publishes um, all sorts of. I mean most of these companies companies will publish like um, different types of like, what do you call it? Just like product catalogs. So like, let's look at Northrop Grumman thrust vector assembly. I spelled thrust wrong. Thrut. <laughs> um, yeah, here it is. It's like a fact sheet. Um, this is not what it is. Uh, where is, I like have it in my download somewhere. Um, hold on. Let me think about this. Northrop Grumman, it's like a Northrop Grumman product catalog. I remember looking at it like a while ago. Cat. Aerospace products. Let's look. I don't think they publish price tags. Oh, uh, Charlie's got one right here. Here we go, I just clicked on it. <laughs> look at this, this is a serious uh, LN200 FOG. So that's fiber optic gyro. Um, these are real deal uh, gyroscopes. So this is like for serious guidance. Um, these are all the things that you see in uh, like the ITAR or USML. These are the regulations for export from the United States. These are all the numbers that they talk about. Um, and the thing that they really talk about a lot is like bias repeatability, um, random walk is a big one. And I don't think they talk about vibration much. They talk about acceleration a lot, greater than 40 G. Um, wow, look at that, 100,000 degrees per second. You could spin something extremely fast and still have a reliable thing. I don't know if this is interesting to anyone. Let me make this a little bit bigger too. Um, I hope this is interesting. So, okay, let's go back. Um, Northrop Grumman product catalog. It's like a motor catalog or something, products. Is this it? It's a big sheet. Oof, Northrop, pal. You should work. You should work on your website design a little bit. You should work on having a better looking website. Um, Northrop Grumman product catalog. Hmm. Okay. Northrop Grumman motor catalog. I think it was mostly. Oh, this might be it. Yeah, propulsion products. This is it. <laughs> this is the one that I found. So they, they list all of the different motors that they make. So I wonder if this is, um, what year is this? June, 2018. Uh, orbital ATK. When did orbital merge with Northrop Grumman? Uh, is there no, I just want the Wikipedia. Um, uh, North of Grumman in 2018. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know exactly when they merged. I think this is, this is before North of Grumman merged. Oh, no, no, no. Cause here's, um, that's the Antares. It must be an updated catalog. Anyway, 
I don't know, it's just cool to look at this stuff. I hope this is interesting to some people, but basically you can buy, well, I mean, you can't like as a, as like a citizen buy a lot of these things, but this is a list of like all of the motors they make. I went through this with, with a friend um, like last year or something like that. And we just specked out like, cool, what, what exactly do you need to buy from Northrop to create an orbital vehicle? Like if you want to build, I think no one thinks about this, but if you wanted to build an orbital launch company, you don't necessarily have to build any of this stuff yourself. You just have to like, like there are contractors who make every single part of a rocket. So you could become another ULA and like people, people, hate on ULA all the time. And I, I think most of it isn't deserved, but um, you could, if you had a, a, like deep pockets, you could just build an orbital vehicle and actually not build most of it. Um, you could buy most of it. So like, let's look at thrust vector. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of them. Okay, yeah, so like, look, they list all of their different products. Here's the star 37, where's the star 48? Star 48. The Star 48 is the motor that propelled, oh geez, hold up. <laughs> Star 48, it's gonna be here. Yeah, here we go. So the Star 48 is the final stage on the Delta IV Heavy that launched the um, uh, the Parker Solar Probe. Excuse me. The, the Delta IV Heavy that launched the Parker Solar Probe. So like you can see all of the different burn times and the burn gradients for the Star 48. Like, look at this, this is so cool. You can see the thrust in pounds, make this a little bit bigger. That's the thrust in pounds, cause Imperial, but um, thrust in pounds, this is like the thrust curve for the Star 48 motor. Um, and it looks like they give you two different lines. Oh, pressure. Yeah, okay, so pressure is on the right side and thrust is on the left. So this is the thrust curve here. And this is the pressure in the motor uh, in PSIA. So, the Star 48, we can find out, has roughly like 550 PSI inside of the motor. Isn't this cool? I don't know if anyone else finds this cool. They just give you all this information. Uh, here's the Star 48A, the B, um, I think one of them, this one might be it. Motor dimensions, nozzle. Yeah, okay, here we go. Initial throat diameter, ex the exit diameter, the expansion ratio, they give you that it's vectorable plus or minus four degrees. Signal is five degrees, but whatever. Um, <laughs> they give you the weights. Like you could just, you could just have a spreadsheet and like build your own rocket with real parts. And then if you want to, you can register with the DDTC as a defense contractor so that you can safely buy all of these components and you could build an orbital launch company like this. Like it's not, it's not easy and it's not cheap and it's not cool looking because people seem to just not like ULA, but this is what, this is what a lot of these companies do. Um, I just find this so cool. Let's look at some other products. Um, I think they had a thrust vectoring like assembly that you can buy. Look, here's a, here's like a solid rocket, like the strap on motor. Um, this is a, High performance, low cost rocket motor uses a first, second, upper stage and sounding rockets. You can buy all this stuff. <laughs> I love this. Look, you can buy launch structures. <laughs> they sell, I think they sell the heat shield and inner stage and bow tail for the Atlas V. This is so cool. I feel like a kid in a Christmas store. Um, Charlie said something earlier that I read some of and I wanna go back and reread. Um, cause it seemed like it was a good thing to read. Uh, there's a running joke about how rocket companies, new vehicles degenerate to being a combination of parts from the orbit, orbital ATK slash Aerojet catalogs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jared just posted the link to the rocket, rocket motor, um, or, uh, sorry, rocket builder from United Launch Alliance. They have one of those. You can build your own Atlas V. Um, Let's look at, um, oh my gosh. Here are the nose cones for the Gem 60. These look like re-entry vehicles. <laughs> um, they had, the last time I looked, I, you could buy just a, ooh, look, ordnance products. These are just things that blow up. <laughs> um, Lunar Prospector Command Timer and S&A Integration Conducted by Innovation Systems. Um, where is, there was like a thrust vector assembly, thrust, 
Yeah, here we go, 119. Let's go to page 119. Here it is. You can buy a thrust vector control assembly, electromechanical thrust vector actuation system. Innovation Systems has developed the first in family of TVA systems designed for low cost modularity. This is like how you gimbal your motor if you want to go to space. <laughs> you can look, you learn all about this. Two channel linear output, brushless DC motors. Brushless is cool because it means they're waterproof. Well, kind of, uh, kind of. Linear variable displacement transducer. So it has, um, it has closed loop feedback. So you can tell which position is, it is actually at. That's a really heavy gimbal for a second stage. Um, revolver rate, resolver rate feedback, digital loop closure. Okay, so this is, this is, the digital loop closure is essentially using the displacement transducer. So they kind of list the same feature twice. RS-22 communication. Um, here are some options. You can customize your thrust vector control assembly. Um, radiation tolerance, military temperature range. Look, you can buy, <laughs> you can buy the orbital, the Orion launch system, abort system, or the control motor. This thing is really cool. I don't know if anyone has seen this before, but the uh, Orion, here we go, YouTube, Orion, um, uh, abort motor test. This thing is super, super cool. This is it. I don't know if anyone has seen this before, but they, they, they like, they don't necessarily throttle one solid motor, but they redirect the thrust of different solid motors. This is this is how the Orion abort system will work in flight, and how will how, like how it will reorient the capsule. Isn't that cool? All right. I don't know if any of this is interesting to anyone anymore. <laughs> I think it's really cool, but um, let's let's take a look. Let's see how are the viewers are at. What's what's the view count right now? 216 still watching. That's crazy. All right. What else what else should we look up? How do I buy buy orbital rocket flight computer? Let's start there. Is it possible? <laughs> um I think I don't think Northrop Grumman makes flight computers. Um Let's look at their their um catalog at the top here. Okay, so large motor summary information, the Orion motors, the caster motors, the gem motors, reusable solid rocket motor. Um, launch abort system, solid motors, launch structures, ordnance products. Okay, that's it. Um, who do you think makes flight computers? I'm sure there are companies that do it. I feel like Bosch would do it. Um, Bosch Aerospace. Does anyone know Bosch Aviation? They might do it. Yeah. Here we go. Hardware development. Engine control systems. I heard BPS.space made flight computers. <laughs> Bosch does. My dad worked for it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Let's look at products. Powertrain, automotive, sensors. This company is the go-to for new small sats. I think Charlie's about to send us a link. Novo. Hmm. Ooh. High performance electronics for the new space age. Thanks, Charlie. Let's look at this. This document is a draft. Oof. I hope it's a good one. Avionics. That is what I'm looking for. High bandwidth subsystems and payloads such as high resolution cameras, high throughput video, avionics, communication pits, synthetic aperture radars. Dang. Space VPX board. Okay, so let's look. Um, that is pretty cool. What do you think they do? Applications. 
synthetic aperture radar, avionics for small sats. That's pretty cool. Let's look. Yeah, all right. Um, communications. Sorry if this is boring. This is really fascinating stuff. Um, so they, the CPU, I wonder if they include, okay, 10 gigabyte per second bandwidth between any two components. So like really fast comms, one terabyte of storage, um, JTAG network, which is cool. This is really cool. I just wonder, okay. Oh, Bay Systems. That's right. Thank you, Chicky. Bay Systems. They probably do it. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Um, oh, man. Electronics. All of these companies, they all have very vague websites. Like if you go to like Lockheed Martin, um, and you want to learn about like, uh, they, I think they, do they do the Minuteman? Um, if you want to learn about like most of these companies and the super, super cool stuff that they do, or like the super secret stuff, it's all very vague. You can get like one public paragraph from the company about it. That's how you know it's serious. <laughs> Here we go. Avionics, uh, autonomous commercial merit military aircraft flight control systems these seem to mostly i mean like the pictures look like they are for just traditional aircraft um active interceptor systems man you know what? Well, this is going to become just like a military stream at some point someone okay chicky sent this Oh, ooh, okay, cool, yeah. With more than 30 years experience, still 15,000 aircraft. I suppose you could use this for a rocket, but you probably... I guess there are like two ways to approach this. You could use... You could use a... Like a Boeing or... You could use like the flight control system for a commercial jet in your launch vehicle. But I don't think that's a great idea, depending on how much control you have over the hardware. Um, like if you have total like total autonomy over the software, then maybe yeah, like the hardware would be f maybe fine. But like, is it good for? Is it rad hard or is it? Uh, can it tolerate like high the high G loads of of launching something? Um, this is pretty serious though. Wow, that's awesome. Eric says, Bay, build some stuff in my hometown. It is intentionally vague to get in the... Yeah. Um, BPS.mil. Honeywell. Ooh, okay. Good man. Chicky, you're giving all the good links. Honey. Honey. You wanna, Should we look up Honey Baked Ham? Ooh. That looks really good. But that's not what we're here for. Hon Honeywell. Okay, Honeywell Aerospace. <laughs> Let's look. What do they do? Look, I don't... Platforms and products. Ooh, actuation. I like that. Electric control actuation, thrust reverser actuation, space actuation controls, marine applications, missile steering. Oh, here we go. Missile steering actuation and controls. Honeywell missile steering actuation and electronic control systems. Speed responsive systems available today. Honeywell's components are typically the solution of choice for interceptor and other strategic high performance missiles. Oof. Bingo. So this is what you would use on your rocket that is not an ICBM. Um, Man, I wonder if they have a catalog. Catalog. Honeywell Aerospace Products. Wow, this is really serious. I didn't know they were this deep into like military stuff. Um, 
I, I'm not like super thrilled with it. Uh, directed energy systems. Uh, sensors, microelectronics, cable management. Um, I don't know where I would go for this one. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna come back into the BPS scale of things. At BPS to space, what material do you use for the body of the rocket? I use cardboard airframes. They're I just buy them off of ApogeeRockets.com. Um, they're pretty easy to work with. They're really light. It's great for the scale. Um, why doesn't North Korea just order stuff from Honeywell? Because of ITAR slash USML laws. So if you go to, um, I feel like any of this stuff, if I look up ITAR. Um, okay, let's look, um, let's do, um, shoot, who makes, I was looking at IMUs the other day. Um, makes sense. I was looking at um, these IMUs the other day, just out of like curiosity, and um, who does, sorry, this is a little bit, yeah, here we go. So these are like pretty serious um, IMUs. And when you start getting into like the really serious things, what you will find is that they start to talk about um, okay, I'm in control measurement and testing heavy industry. If I look for ITAR or USML, nope, they won't talk about it. Um, so, uh, what if I look at the G710? Let's look at this one. ITAR. No. So a lot of these companies sometimes will, will say something like they are ITAR compliant or something like that. Um, uh, let's have uh, a high grade IMU. Who does, okay, Honeywell will definitely talk about it. Inertial measurement units, oh gosh, they just, uh, ITAR, military. Yeah, they won't talk about it either. Um, Oh, analog devices has a bunch of uh, great like middle ground stuff. Here we go. This is how we'll do it. Um, if you look under products, and then I'm just like doing this live, so I'm trying to see what this will look like. But if you look under products and then go to um, sensors and MEMS, IMUs, I am inertial measurement units. Hold on, we're almost there. Will it tell us if it is ITAR compliant? Let's look for something that has a really um, in runs. Uh, I guess you could do the. They won't tell us the price either. Basically, um, so basically, a lot of these companies that do lots of middle ground things will tell you pretty much off the bat, like, let's look at this, um, 10 degree, degrees of freedom, hold on, gyro range, put in bias stability, I guess, we'll just click on a random one. We have to, like, look at some of these things. So, in here, what we'll find under the data sheet probably ITAR. No, oh my gosh, sometimes they talk about it. ITAR. Okay, what I'm trying to point, what I'm trying to prove, and I'm doing an awful job doing, um, is that a lot of these units, this is in answer to a question that was asked, I don't know, roughly a billion hours ago, about like why doesn't country X buy aerospace products for their missiles, if country X wants to make missiles. And the answer is that a lot of these products are, oh, here we go, Arsenio, tactical grade IMU. He just texted me, this is this is what you look for. Um, look, I think this is even analog devices. Um, oh no, no it's not. <sighs> yes. So essentially what you're looking for is 
what I'm looking for is whether it is ITAR compliant. So the ITAR or International uh, Traffic and Arms Regulations regulation is uh, a definition by the U.S. government is a regulation by the U.S. government um, that is complied by a bunch of different countries, more than the U.S. alone. And it talks about what technology can and cannot be moved around the world. Um, so after a certain point, like on Signal, these IMUs are cell phone grade. The IMU stands for Inertial Measurement Unit. These are cell phone grade, which means they are fairly low quality in the grand scheme of things. Now, they're great for flights that last 20 to 50 seconds, um, but they're not great for um, if you wanted to put something in space really accurately or, you know, just go anywhere really accurately. So you would want something that's higher quality. And after a certain point, they get to a high enough quality where if you have an intent to harm, <laughs> it's not good. And that's what that's what ITAR tries to protect. So a lot of these gyros that will be able to provide you really, 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 really high accuracy sensing, um, they, like, analog devices or Bay Systems or Bosch or Honeywell, none of these companies will be able to sell to other countries without a direct authorization from the U.S. government, and if they do not comply, they will be fined and punished severely. So, like, ITAR punishment. Here we go. Violations of the ITAR can bring civil penalties of 500000 per violation and criminal penalties of up to $1 million per violation. Um, but you know who re recently got it pretty bad is, um, oh, Fleur ITAR. Fleur does, um, yeah, 30 million settlement, uh, 15 million civil penalty. Like, if you mess this stuff up, you get, you get burned really, really, really bad. <laughs> That's why you don't want to mess with ITAR. Um, okay, we are way deep into, uh, all sorts of all sorts of memes here. So let's let's pull back out um, and just go to the webcam again. So uh, one second here. Hello again. It's me, Joey B. So let's go to the live stream. Let's take like a couple couple more questions and then we'll probably close it out here. Um, so someone asked something. Even if you wanted to, you're not allowed to make a gyro too accurate and stick it in a toy drone. <sighs> There's a lot of nuance with this type of stuff. You can't really, like, unless you are Raytheon or Bay Systems or Honeywell or Bosch or any or, or Northrop Grumman, any of these companies, like, you can't... You need, you need to have millions of dollars of equipment in order to build your own gyro that is really, really accurate. It's not illegal to do. It's not illegal to build your own stuff. It's illegal to start selling it and exporting it from the U.S. Where you get in trouble with ITAR is not building it, but exporting it. Or sharing the knowledge that is required for other people to build it. Um, okay, future designs for, for your rockets besides what you have. Let's, let's get out of the military land, because it gets real scary real quick. So, Thrusty McThrust Faced, he's, Thrusty McThrust Faced is back there. You can kind of see it just chilling out. That guy is going to be flying a couple times in 2019. Hopefully, at least uh, at least one or two passive flights first, and then we'll stick an RCS package on there. That is reaction control system. Um, okay, cool. Uh, is it legal to make a liquid or hybrid rocket? Yep, it's legal to make that, and after a certain point, it is not legal to share the information. But by and large, it is legal. Yeah. Um, although you should check with like your local regulations. I, I'm, that is not a definitive statement, and that is not legal advice. Um, uh, hey, Joe, just joined in. Could you use multiple lower-grade gyros and then use software to average the readings? Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks for joining in. Yeah, you could. You could definitely do that. Um, it would help a little bit. Um, and I just, like, after a certain point, if you're really trying to get that accurate it's still a better idea to just trust one or uh, well it's still a better idea like if you need to get that accurate you will already have the money to how do i say this let's say you're trying to go to orbit i'm doing a whole lot of talking i hope no one minds but like who else is going to talk i guess but like let's say you're trying to go to orbit it is so tremendously expensive already to get to orbit even if you're buying a ride, but like, let's say you're just trying to get to orbit. Let's say you're like a vector, um, 
the orbital launch company. <laughs> Anyone, no one will take you seriously if you just use 50 different MEMS gyroscopes. Um, you just, I guess I just don't know how to say it. You're already spending so much money um, on building each launch vehicle. You should just use like the right gyro. You really don't want to mess that up. So I think in theory, yes, you could average out lots of readings from smaller gyroscopes. It just doesn't seem like an excellent idea um, in the long run. I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. I guess I just don't know how to describe what I think about that. <laughs> um, also, hold on, I missed this. Aton, thank you so much for the donation. That's really kind. Hey man, awesome content. You know soon you'll be a lead leading in big space company, right? Since you kindly share so much knowledge, it's just a matter of time. Well, I, I it's not. It's probably not going to be a space company. I love doing the model rocket stuff, and I'm glad that people seem to be interested in it too. But thank you so much. Um. Uh. Let's see. When is the next model Falcon Heavy launch? Very soon. It's coming up in uh, probably a couple of weeks. All right. Um. Would it be worth it to make a liquid fuel rocket engine on a small scale to help with controlling thrust for landing? Yes and no. Uh, liquid engines will definitely uh, let you throttle more, but you need a lot, 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 a lot of hardware to control them. So you need to make your engine very powerful before your rocket can actually lift off the ground. And that means your rocket has to be very heavy as well. Um, John Tech, thank you for the email. I think I actually saw it on my phone. Thanks for sending that. I'll get back to you soon. This week is like crazy hectic, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, uh, do you think there will be an ongoing job market for software engineers in the aerospace industry? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I actually have no idea. I think so, but I, I have no good... Um, <laughs> I'm probably not the person to ask about that. Um, okay, we'll take a couple more questions, and then we'll probably you know, scoot. So let's see, how excited am I for DM1? Super excited, I'm gonna be there, probably, almost certainly. Um, could Signal R2 be used on multiple of my rockets? Uh, Owen, you should maybe clarify the question a little bit. You could use it on as many different rockets as you want. You could use several Signal R2s in the same rocket, although that rocket won't be able to fly for very long before they start to really disagree on like what direction the rocket is traveling. Good night, Charlie. Thanks for stopping by. Um, any progress on the dual motor gimbal for takeoff and landing? I'm not working on one of those. Um, I, it's, there are a lot of, there's, um, it's really hard to control roll with that type of setup. I'm not working on one of those. Um, okay. Do your motors have parachute charges? If not, where do you buy the ones you use? The motors that I use do have parachute charges. This is the one thing I do that is not NIR legal. Um, and it is that I, re I manually remove the ejection charge from the motors. Um, I don't recommend doing it unless you are being really safe about it. Um, but it is, it is what it is. Sometimes you have to break a couple of eggs. Um, Jacob, thanks for the donation. <laughs> Thank you so much for the donation and for being a patron and for ordering the signal kit. Um, looking forward to the kit coming and doing some testing for you. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to get those shipped out. Um, this week I'm placing another big order with the manufacturing company we're using for the PCBs. Just gearing up to start shipping kits again. I'm really excited. But thank you so much. Um, all right. And I think that's probably it. Do I play Kerbal Space Program? Of course. you got to play Kerbal. Um, <laughs> eventual fairing landing somehow. The fairings land just... You know, they just fall. They do land, but they just land by falling. Uh, is your work Arduino-based? If not, what hardware do you use for your rockets? Yes, it is Arduino-based. Uh, it's all in the Arduino IDE. Um, eventually, like, I'll probably have to grow out of that, but um, right now that's where the whole code base exists. Okay, Rocket Builder real quick, says Jared. I think I'm probably going to pass on the Rocket Builder for now, but thank you so much to everyone for joining this is a pretty long live stream, to be honest. It looks like we've been going for a little over three hours at this point. So thank you so much for joining. Um, appreciate all of the support. And 
Um, for those of you who are coming to the National Rocketry Conference this weekend, I will see you there. And if you're not going to be there, don't worry. I will be publishing all the footage of the talk and presentation. Um, that'll be on this YouTube channel, hopefully within a week or so, or you know, probably like a week and a half. But um, and then after that, let's just talk about more plans. After that, we're doing landing test in March. Another couple of launches for Scout in March should be really good. Um, and yeah, Jared, maybe I'll see you at DM One. I'll probably see you at Narcon. I think you're going there anyway, right? Um, yeah. Will I do more future live streams? Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. I will definitely do that. Okay. Thank you so much for joining. It is time for me to go. Have a good night. May your skies be blue and your winds be low. Oh my gosh. I have to transition. I'm in the different OBS thing. May your skies be blue. <laughs> May your skies be blue and your winds be low.